Good evening. I'd like to call the meeting to order and welcome you to the regular meeting of the Milwaukee Planning Commission. Agendas and additional copies of staff reports are available on the table in the hall. If you have not picked up an agenda, please do so. It contains important information about the process. If you wish to be included in the mailing list for a decision, please add your name and contact information to the sign up list sheet listed in the, on the table in the hallway. If you wish to testify, please also fill out a yellow comment card. We will follow the basic format listed on the back of the agenda. It includes all of the hearing procedure steps. We may vary from the process based on the specific circumstances of each hearing. Um, next on the agenda is approval of minutes from a couple of meetings, but I'm gonna ask that we defer that because I didn't get a chance to read those. So we could do that next meeting. Wow. Um, <laughs> slacker, I know. Um, so after that, we have information items. Are there informational items from staff? Well, just again, that um, April seems to be housing month in Milwaukee, and we have a slew of meetings. Um, the Comp Plan Advisory Committee will um, meet um, first and again talk about housing issues. April 3rd is an open house on the cottage cluster and ADU projects. April 16th is a joint meeting that the Planning Commission and Council have um, where you'll get a presentation uh, about the cottage cluster and ADU work. And then on April 18th, we have our town, comprehensive plan town hall focused on housing. So it's a, a busy month. Okay, thank you. Audience participation. This is an opportunity to comment on items not on tonight's agenda. If you wish to comment on an item that is on the agenda, there will be time for comments after the presentation. Does anyone wish to comment on an item that is not on tonight's agenda? Okay. Okay, um, next is our public hearing. Which I already lost, okay. The public hearing on appeal number AP-2019-002 is called to order. The purpose of this hearing is to consider an appeal filed by Robert and Carla Plekta. Plekta. Challenging a condition of approval for DEV-2019-002, a development review for a change in use at 11380 Southeast 21st Avenue. The appeal process requires that the commission conduct an unrestricted de, de novo hearing, which allows for the presentation of new evidence, testimony, and arguments by any party. The applicable standard of review is set forth in zoning ordinance subsection 19.1010.3, types of appeals hearings. A successful appeal requires that the commission determine that the initial decision has findings and or conditions that are in error as a matter of fact or law. The original decision was based on applicable standards and criteria of the Milwaukee Municipal Code. The code sections where the standards and criteria can be found are, I gotta read those? Staff usually reads those. Um, MMC section 19.1010 appeals, MMC section 12.16 access management, MMC section 19.304 downtown mixed use zone, MMC chapter 19.700 public facility improvements, and MMC section 19.1004 type one review. All testimony and evidence must be directed to, toward the applicable substantive criteria. Failure to address a criterion or raise an issue with sufficient detail to allow the Planning Commission an adequate opportunity to respond to each issue precludes further appeal based on that issue. Failure to raise constitutional or other issues with sufficient detail to allow a response precludes an action for damages in circuit court. This decision will be the City of Milwaukee's final local decision on land use file number DE V-2019-002. Um, the order of business we will follow in conducting this hearing will be um, 
One, discussion of impartiality, site visits, and jurisdiction. Two, staff introduction of the appeal, presentation of the staff report, then correspondence received, then the appellant will have 15 minutes, and then other testimony, three minutes each, additional staff comments, then appellant's rebuttal and final remarks, 10 minutes, and then questions from the commission to staff, closure of the public hearing, discussion and decision by the commission. I will recognize those persons who have completed the testimony cards and give them to, given them to me. When you come to the podium, please state your name and address for the record so they may be entered into the minutes. If you are here to testify, please remember to confine your remarks to the application and the relevant criteria and to avoid repetition and irrelevant information. If additional documents or evidence are provided by any party, the commission may, if requested, allow a continuance or leave the record open to allow the parties a reasonable opportunity to respond. Any such continuance or extension shall be the subject, subject to the limitations of the 120 day rule unless the continuance or extension is requested or agreed to by the applicant. All right. Now, conflicts of interest in site visits. Does any member of the Planning Commission wish to abstain from this hearing? No. 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 Does any member of the Planning Commission wish to declare an actual or potential conflict of interest? No. no. Does any member of the Planning Commission wish to report on any ex parte contacts? No. no. Yes. yes. Okay. I'll, I'll go first. I was at the site earlier today and I um, had a conversation with the neighbor, neighboring property owner who shares a driveway access and uh, he talked about his use of the driveway and that was the extent of it. So Ms. Plutka and I, uh, uh, unknowingly knowing each other's position, had a conversation on the telephone today. She called the Milwaukee Museum uh, looking for uh, historical pictures uh, of the property. Uh, and uh, I said that the museum would be happy to provide that uh, information to her. Okay. Does anyone have any rebuttal to the ex parte contacts declared by commissioners? Okay, um, will any commissioner who has visited the site prior to this hearing please raise their hand? All right, did any of those commissioners who visited the site speak to anyone at the site other than you or note anything different from what is indicated in the staff report for this application? No. no. Does any member of the audience wish to challenge the participation of any member of the planning commission? Um, does any member of the audience wish to challenge the jurisdiction of the Planning Commission to hear this matter? Okay. Well, let's proceed to the staff report presentation. Uh, good evening. Vera Coley, Associate Planner, here to present the staff report. Um, Order of business was already discussed by the chair. Um, the hearing, um, as was described, um, will be conducted in an unrestricted de novo manner. So um, new evidence, testimony, and arguments by any party um, can be entered into the record uh, for tonight. Can uh, the, the mic down just a minute? Sorry. OK. Uh, the standard of review for the commission is whether the initial decision, uh, the development review, has findings or conditions that are in error as a matter of fact or law. The subject property is here outlined in blue, um, 11380 Southeast 21st Avenue. It's approximately 0.19 acres in area and is zoned downtown mixed use. The lot is located at the corner of Main Street and 21st Ave um, and is developed with a 3,400 square foot commercial building. Property has three existing driveways that access abutting streets. You can see those driveways here um, on this uh, on this image, on February 12th, 2019, the planning director issued a notice of decision to approve land use file uh, DEV 2019-002, which was a development review for a change in use of the property. The proposed uh, use are, is two businesses, a primarily internet retail business that sells electronic tubes, uh, vacuum tubes for amplifiers, and the other portion of the building would be used as a tap room with occasional musical entertainment. Uh, as a change in use from manufacturing um, and repair to 
to retail in a tap room, the code requires that the site be uh, brought closer into conformance uh, with the code, particularly with Title 12 um, of the, the Municipal Code, which is the access management section. The increase in the number of vehicle trips for the proposed use triggers 19700, which is public improvements, um, and that takes you to Title 12 and requires conformance with Title 12. The development review required that the easternmost driveway, driveway C, uh, be closed in order to comply with the access management standards. The applicants and the property owners, Robert and Carla Pletka, appealed the decision on February 27th, which was within the allotted 15-day appeal period, based on concerns about having to close driveway C, stating that it is critical to their use of the property. Frontage improvements um, at the site, and you can see in the photos, uh, driveways A and B, and driveway A is the uh, driveway that shares access with the neighboring property, um, driveway B, and then driveway C in the lower uh, photograph. Frontage improvements were completed on the property by TriMet uh, with the construction of the orange line. Before the frontage improvements were completed, there were three existing driveways on the site. As the improvements were triggered by the traffic impact of TriMet and not by private development of the subject property, all three driveways were reconstructed as part of the TriMet project. Removal of any one of the driveways, um, we think, would have been considered sort of like a taking because it was an existing situation and there was nothing to trigger removal of one of those driveways. When a property develops and triggers frontage improvements, the developer is generally required to bring the site into conformance with current code. The proposed use of the subject property is increasing the trip generation from the former use um, and is therefore required to bring the frontage into conformance or as close to conformance as possible with the code. So the key issues here um, are the code section 12.16 which talks about access ways and access way spacing on arterial streets. Uh, because of the change in use, as I said, from the manufacturing use to the retail and the sort of drinking establishment restaurant uh, would increase the vehicle trips. Uh, the, re the approval of the development review required that the applicant bring the site into conformance with 12.16, which is the access management standards. The site is located um, on Lake Road. Sorry, I, I misspoke earlier. It's Lake Road and 21st Avenue, uh, both of which are classified as arterial streets. And per the code section 12.16040B1, access ways and arterial streets are to be spaced 600 feet apart from adjacent access ways. However, um, that in, in that same code section, um, it requires that all pro properties be provided or have, a, have an access way. Um, the subject property has a total of 121 feet of frontage. So an access way to the property would be in conflict with the spacing requirements by virtue of just having an access way. So um, the site can't comply with the driveway spacing requirements by even having just the one but conditions of approval were included to bring the site closer into conformance. So um, the conditions of approval included that driveway A, because it functions as, a, um, as an access way for two properties, that stays um, and it can't be removed. Driveway B would be signed as an in only uh, driveway to provide access for delivery vehicles and to allow them to maneuver on the site without having to uh, back out or exit out onto, out onto the street so that all backing movements are occurring on the site. And then driveway C, excuse me, C to the east would be removed uh, in order to comply with the spacing requirements for access ways on the on arterial classification street. The basis of appeal and the full appeal was in um, as part of the staff report um, on part of the appellants um, was that site parking um, was needed on the site. Um, the downtown mixed use zone does not require off street parking for commercial uses, and a parking plan was not submitted as part of the development review. So we didn't we didn't know that parking was going to be part of the development review. It wasn't presented. We don't know where those parking spaces um, are. So we would need to confirm compliance with the parking section of the code to know where, where those were going to happen. Um, access to the site would remain um, on the site. One of the, um, one of the uh, concerns that was expressed in the appeal uh, was that they need that access for driveway C for deliveries. Um, but access to that site would still remain. Deliveries could happen via, um, via hand truck um, from the front um, and around to the back of the building. That could still occur, but they would not have direct 
uh, vehicular access with the delivery of vehicles, but there are alternatives um, to that. Um, they talked about that there weren't, there haven't been, to their knowledge, any accidents at the driveway um, at driveway C. Uh, the police department did confirm that within the last three to five years, there there have only been two um, accidents, um, and one was sort of was more at the actual intersection of 21st and Lake, and one was closer into the vicinity of actual driveway C. Uh, they talked about um, that, again, access for deliveries is needed and only, and it would be only for occasional use. Uh, 12.16 was, pro in our opinion, um, in staff's opinion, was properly applied to the development review and no error in or interpretation of the code was made. Parking details and additional loading requirements were not made part of the original land use discussion um, or that application. Uh, there is another route for the applicant um, if driveway C is critical to the use of the property. Um, 12.16040B2 um, provides for a process to modify the access spacing requirement. Uh, the engineering director can make a determination uh, with the submission of an access study prepared by a traffic engineer um, and certified um, by that traffic engineer. So if information is submitted to the uh, to the engineering director, uh, the engineering director can make a decision to modify the spacing requirements and they could keep um, driveway C open. Um, it is a costly process. Traffic engineers aren't free um, and there is not a guarantee of success um, on the engineering director's part. It would depend on what material was submitted to the engineering director. Um, but again, um, staff is of the opinion that um, that the, the code was properly applied to the development review. Um, again, the hearing is conducted as an unrestricted de novo, um, and the, again, the, the standard of review uh, for the commission is whether the initial decision had an error in matter of, in, um, an error um, in findings of fact um, or law. The commission has some decision-making op um, options here. Um, first is to um, deny the appeal, which would uphold the original uh, decision uh, for the development review um, and adopt the recommended findings and conditions of approval uh, with any added language to clarify if needed. Um, could approve the appeal um, and uphold the appeal with findings modified to reflect an identified error of fact or law in the original decision. Um, and we would have to develop revised conditions of approval and revised findings for that. Um, could also continue the hearing for further discussion. Um, at this point, with the appeal filed, the 120-day deadline for the development review um, extends. It's May 25th. So the appeal kind of has that development review sort of in limbo because it's part of that, um, that application. Um, and so the option three um, could be to continue the hearing um, to allow for the applicant to go through that modification process if that's what the um, appellant would like to do. Sorry, I'm using appe appellant and applicant kind of interchangeably. Apologies, the appellant um, could do that. But that concludes my the staff report um, presentation. Happy to answer any clarifying questions. Um, Alex Roller is here from the engineering department if you have any questions specific to Title 12 um, and those access standards or any other questions about that. Anyone have any questions? Yes. Okay. So uh, you, you mentioned that there is a, um, a procedure that the applicant can, uh, or the applicant can uh, apply in addition to, uh, to, mo to modify, is it a modification, is that what you call it? Correct, right. Um, <clears throat> what effect uh, does our decision today have on their ability to um, file that application as part of you know, this land use review? Or to complement this land use review, because I'm, mean, you know, if when this becomes final, I'm assuming that at that point they will need to close the driveway. Correct. And so, does that have any impact on their ability to subsequently file for a modification? I think when we were discussing this from a procedural standpoint earlier today, um, the thought was that the um, that the appeal would be continued, the hearing would be continued if the appellant wish to go forward with that modification process. So they would kind of both, this would get continued while that modification process is happening. Um, and that way the development review, um, we, would, we would modify essentially that development review approval um, to reflect that modification were that approved by the engineering director. Do I have that right? Well, I, I think we were, we were thinking that it would probably be best for them to keep the, um, sort of the application open in a sense, um, 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that there is, and I'm not sure this is true with the development review, but there, for some land use applications that we have that you can't resubmit basically the same application for a certain right. amount of time. I have to double check that. So to try to av avoid that catch, we thought it would make more sense for them to, um, if they wanted to go through the modification process, to ask for a continuance where they could where they could do that. And then at the time, um, when we get to the end of this, we could basically void the original approval and they could with draw the appeal and deal with the other, deal with the modified um, decision at that point. Sort of similar to what we were doing with, the, with that other one. Sounds familiar. Um, a little bit, little bit different <laughs> though. Um, and uh, yeah, we, th this is not, you know, it's, it's not normal process. We, we're, we're um, there may be other ways to approach it. I'm not just. I'm not sure what what it might be, though. So the the modification that would be requested would be a modification to this decision. It would be no. It's a modification to that standard okay. as it would apply to this development review. Okay. We would so we would treat it just like it was part of the application materials from the start. Okay. They want to modify that code requirement. Right. Perfect. So, um, I mean, I I think it. It may help. Um, you know, it sort of depends on on what the direction of the commission is to some degree on the current on the current application as to maybe what what they want to do. But I mean, they also also may have some information for you that points to an error here. Um, uh, but all in all, um, we we don't have. <laughs> We've we've stumbled across this twice now in the last couple in the last month where we're we're dealing with an appeal of a director decision, and the the criteria criteria are narrower than they are for the for a normal decision, and there isn't sort of that clear path to how do you resolve that. So I think the I think the best way to do it again would be to continue um, if they wanted to uh, pursue that modification path. Okay. Did you find it? No, it doesn't okay. seem to apply to development reviews. I, yeah, like you had I, mean, I mean, we can look for that, and if it's true that you can reapply for a same the same application, that we might not need to keep it um, open. Okay. Oh, if if I may, through the chair, it's specific to resubmittal of applications following a denial. Okay. That you have to wait two years before. Two years. Uh, yeah. For a denial. Yes. Right. So this would be. This wouldn't necessarily be a denial. No. It's an a, mm -hmm. a, it's a denial of an appeal, but it's a it would be an approval of a development application. Right. right. And they would still have the approval. Yeah. Exactly. So I, I guess you can you can act on this today. They could reapply for the for a development application with the modification. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh huh. Okay. Go ahead. So I'm just kind of, what was, uh, what does that mean to block the driveway? Does that just mean that all you need to do is, do you have to actually put in curb or a pole and a, a chain and a chain or? No, it, it would be a removal of it. So you reconstruct it so it's just full height curb. Um, yeah, they have the trigger for full improvements. They just happen to be lucky that most of them were done with TriMet already. So that would just be their one section of improvements they'd be building. So just basically build up the sidewalk and create a curb. Yeah. Um, so when I, when I look at the site, um, it seems that that driveway had maybe a different access point than originally to this building. Did the city look to see that if there was a uh, shared access or an agreement with a fellow property owner like Milwaukee High School um, that allowed them to use it that may make this null and void? Um, I, I think this entire driveway is on their property. Um, it's close to the edge of the property line with the high school, but um, from my knowledge, at least before all the improvements were done, that wall has been there for years and years. There would be no way to access the high school property. OK. 
Okay. And how how would something like this uh, be allowed in the first place? Um, it, it happens a lot of a lot of times. Whenever we're, we do our, our safe projects that we're doing now, um, there are these non-conforming driveways. They're really wide, or there's three of them across a lot. Um, it's you know they're not really formalized or just gravel sometimes. So we have to keep them. Um, it, it, I don't know if it was part of kind of how it always been kind of thought. Okay. Um, so a couple of times this uh, staff report mentions closer into conformance. Um, so is it that you, this has to get closer to conformance or it has to conform? Because I, I think there's, there's other places in here where it says requires conformance. Right. So I guess like what's closer to or required? Full conformance with the code as it relates to the accesses would actually be closures of B and C. I see. Um, oh, that's and, fine. Okay. And A. I see. Well, a, a is what we want. It's shared with an adjacent property. There's as few driveways as possible. Um, but it's too close. Okay. But it is also right, yes. at the intersection. I, I, ideally, if there was not a shared driveway at A, it would be just C, which is, you know, farthest away from the intersection, farthest away from queuing, mm -hmm. would be where they would get the driveway. Okay. But then since we have the shared with the neighbor, that kind of threw all the priorities around a little bit. Okay. And keeping B open helps make sure that maneuvering is all happens on site. Yeah. So... Um, but it would need to be an enter only. But so we're bringing it closer into conformance, understanding what the function of the site is, as well as um, the access for the neighboring property. So trying to balance all of the yeah. realities of what's okay. happening out there. Yeah. Thank you. So I had a question, two questions. There's a, um, you can see it in the photo by driveway B, uh, sort of semi-temporary, it looks like a speed bump that could block a low rider from entering, but wouldn't, block a normal car or pickup truck. And I don't know if the city has any knowledge of what, what that is and why it's there. Well, yeah, I, I think it was placed there by the previous owner. Um, I don't think it was a requirement of any means. It was just, I think he wanted to make sure that he could pull up and face that way maybe for parking. Okay. I'm um, not sure. Maybe they might have a better idea of, of why it was put okay. there. I'll ask the question again when the, the applicant comes up. Um, I, I also had a question around, um, you talk about, you know, containing the backing movements onto the side. Is that, um, that sounds like a good idea, but is it a requirement in code or is it just a good idea right. that the city's? Code uh, it is. Um, if you were, um, there's kind of a, a four different items and they're an and, so they all of those are required for creating a new driveway on an arterial or collector. Um, it maintain backing movements, share if you can, um, maintain, um, there's a couple others. Um, but yes, the, the backing movement is, is kind of the reason that we wanted to keep B open. It would bring A a little closer, especially with A being essentially part of the intersection, almost treating it like a, a third, fourth leg of the intersection. So if there were not the, the backing requirement, if backing could occur on site, the city would likely have required both A and B to close, but it's it's that that and back. Well, no, um, B and C. Sorry, because B of the would required yeah. B and C to yeah. close. Thank you, I misspoke. Correct. Okay. And that's only because of the shared parking, right? That that A stays open. Yeah. Yep. Okay. If I could, it's shared access, not shared, shared parking. Sorry, right. Shared nope. Access. Just want to make sure. Yep. Right. Okay, any other questions for staff? Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, um, have we received any correspondence on this matter other than those items included in the meeting packet? No, we have not. I have Okay, so yeah, we'll take those. I, actually, it's time for you guys to come up. It's the appellant testimony portion. Um, and so you can come on up. And um, so are, are you gonna be presenting and then others will be submitting comment? Is that how we start this? You're gonna start, okay. Goes. I don't think they wanna add comment or. Okay, so why don't you come on up and Vera can pass those around, great. 
Excuse my appearance. Yeah. Okay, I just came from the building. <laughs> I'm the head grunt. <laughs> so we'll have you um, speak into the mics and then state your name and address for the record. The address of the building or our personal address? Um, the address of the building. Okay. Yeah. John Henry. Maybe another one right here. Thank you, Vera. Thank you. There it is. Okay. Start with that. Okay. Okay, so we thank the commission for listening to us and our plight here. <laughs> I'm Carla Pletka, and we're speaking about 11380 Southeast 21st Avenue in downtown Milwaukee. And what I handed you, I originally my appeal um, was very quickly developed and, and having extra time, then I we came together with this second one. So I'm going to not jump around too much, but um, I do want to start with the one that you were just handed as an introduction so you get to know us a little bit. Um, we own a family business named Eurotubes. And uh, let me see here, I'll just... Uh, we are an industry leader in creating new design applications for selling vacuum tubes and amplification parts to musicians and hi-fi enthusiasts all across the globe, mostly via the internet. We are a 20-year-old family business that's been looking for a new location for expansion of sales and new products and development. We currently have five employees, and our family is right here. Um, what you're looking at is a high-end uh, amplifier, and the vacuum tubes are what power that, and and so that's what we sell. We import them from the Slavic Republic and literally sell them all over the world. Uh, purchasing the building at 11380 21st Avenue has given us room to expand with room to spare. As an aside, our son's dream has been to also have a location that could also support demonstrations of vacuum tubes, hi-fi gear. Um, you know, we're starting a bar and the bar was not in the original plan. So I get into that in a little bit here. Okay, but with such a wonderful vintage building that coincides with our vintage products, our very creative family became inspired with many possibilities for the extra space. The one idea that really resonated was to be able to sit back, enjoy some food and drink while listening to quality music. Not much different than your area sports bar. Now we have room to achieve both vision, sale, and sounds demonstrations. So we created Decibel Sound and Drink, which is the bar and tap room. And the emphasis on, is on sound. We're not trying to create a low-end place where people come in and get sloshed, <laughs> basically. Um, so let's see here. Let me show you something. Um, this is the front of the building, and what we're doing is we're splitting the inside of the building, and the split will actually occur to the right of that front door. So as you go into that door, that will be Eurotubes. And they'll go down the side of the building into the back of the building partially. And then to the right, there's a double door over here on the corner. I didn't get a picture of that. And that will be the entrance to um, Decibel. Uh, let's see here. Okay. So I guess I want to start out with the benefits. What is, what's the benefit to Milwaukee? Leaving the driveway intact as is will help reduce an already strained demand for parking for other businesses at no additional cost to the city. We understand that the city has authority to interpret its own codes, allowing for flexibility and exceptions. Um, you'll see also, I know you were talking about the corner and uh, connecting to Milwaukee High School, that small wedge um, down on Lake Road, actually, I don't know if it belongs to the high school or the city, but it's not ours. And so maybe that pertains to the question about whether there was a, an original access at some other point. I don't know how that came about. Yeah, actually we were told, uh, do I have to push? Testing, 
It's a green light uh, on. <laughs> so we were told by Rick Wheeler, the person that we're buying the property from, uh, that the wall that separates the parking lot from the high school uh, was built three feet onto their property. So in our little back area, uh, we don't have, well, I should say the, the wall is there and then three feet actually does belong to the school. So I can't tell you exactly where that line is uh, down at the foot, mm -hmm. okay. but it is closer than, than what is shown there. So anyway, um, this parking is located at the southernmost location of any business in South Milwaukee and is not visible to the food cart location, the new public circle, or axle tree. It's not going to affect visibility of the plan. It also meets the goals of the city vision to have employees park at the north and south ends of the city and therefore supports the vision of the south downtown concept plan. In keeping with the vision of maintaining Milwaukee's historic buildings, we would like to display photos and history of the building and the surrounding location inside our business to share with our customers. So we just think this is a really cool building and they might like to know about it. Uh, we want to create a pleasant, inviting atmosphere for adults to gather and enjoy the sounds of quality music on a high-end audio system while also being able to enjoy well-made cocktails or craft beers with a light food menu. menu. This will be a very relaxed but a bit more upscale establishment for the city with marble tabletops, couches, low cocktail coffee tables, low lighting, and a display of audio gear. And we're going to be playing all sorts of music. We're going to go Motown, you name it, rock, uh, probably some country, just, you know, try to have some specialty times there. Um, our international exposure website and customer base will increase the visibility of downtown Milwaukee. And I can't emphasize that enough. Um, we're small, but we're well known around the world for what we do. And people will be coming from places and stopping in. And, and you know, it's a, a nice thing for Milwaukee. Um, some of the logistics, two businesses can't share the roll-up door because that wall is going through there. There's no access between one or the other. Um, causes a hardship to have the grease trap cleaned. I don't know how they would do that without getting access into that driveway because that goes right into the kitchen area. Uh, garbage container placement will be needed. We haven't even figured out where we're going to put that. We could put it down there if we had access to it. One ADA space is required. And to remove this driveway or any of the driveways will not make the lot meet the codes. And I guess I don't, I can't say that you've made an error but I can say that no matter what you do or what we do, we won't meet the codes. So we will not comply. <laughs> anyway, um, sorry, excuse me. The driveway access was removed once and then replaced, demonstrating that there is a case for it to be grandfathered into the site. Also, the property is still held by the current owner, not an institution like a bank. Per the city, TriMet's contractors inadvertently removed the access. We talked about that. Um, the access was restored after Mr. Wheeler made a quick visit to the city, avoiding legal action. It should remain intact as we agreed, agreed to with him when the driveway was reinstalled. Uh, final points from this page. Uh, parking around this area is a coveted commodity. And people are fighting for parking, especially around those food carts. It only stands to reason that if access was removed, the value of the property would be reduced. We purchased this property with full intentions of having driveway access as is. This is a legacy building for our family. We plan on being here involved with the city for a long time and would be greatly impacted financially over the long haul due to reduced property value and ability to run our business more efficiently. I do, I think I skipped something here. Oh, I'm, I'm going to go back just for a minute. Um, we have plans to be part of the act city activities in the school as well. We have an employee that would like to have an electronics theory and design class on building amplifiers. We can see support of the music program in some way. We imagine having special uh, specials during home games, special for teachers possibly, if that's acceptable, being the anchor business for the south end of the city during citywide events like First Friday, Umbrella Parade, etc. And I was also a uh, PTO president for two and a half years at North Oak Grove School, so I'm very familiar with um, 
working with the schools and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I, I have a lot to add and not a lot to offer myself um, without the building, the business. So anyway, I'm gonna go back to this last page. Okay, we see, you know, the developers of Axel Tree were allowed to not only build an additional floor on top of the standard approved three floors, but two additional floors. This had to have greatly increased the value of the sale, but also increased the pedestrian dangers being in such close proximity to the rail lines and multiple intersections. I mean, that's a very scary place up there with all the tracks and the arms going up and down, and then you have a, a very tight road going in front of a, uh, that establishment. Our small driveway access has clear visibility from both sides of Lake Road. Let's see here. That's that's the front. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Oh, dear. There you go. As you can see, this this is the um, the driveway. And when you come in or out of that driveway, there is no issue with visibility whatsoever. You have a long span up here to see if anybody's coming, to see any students are coming whatsoever. It's not like you're going into a blind spot. You're actually in a very clear area. And this is at the corner. This is actually driveway, I think you're calling it B here, and then C is up here. And you can see a long way, even if traffic happened to be backed up from the train or whatever. I mean, there's no visibility issue whatsoever. So therefore, we are asking for the same consideration, flexibility, and exception as the newer developments. We aren't asking for something that would increase the value, but to only maintain what we have paid for, what we need. We really need that access. You can imagine, um, we need it for various things. I can't even say right now, you know, specifically what it's gonna be, but we know we're gonna need it for deliveries, for the grease. Oh, this is my son, Eddie. Yeah, uh, my name is Eddie Pletka, uh, the son of these two. Yeah, why don't you bring up another chair? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, actually, I'd really just like to point up here for a second. Okay, um, get down by the mic back. so that we can hear you. Can you flash back to the overhead, Mom? Yeah, which one? With the outline. Yeah, that's fine. But you got to talk into the mic is the only problem. Sorry. Mouse. Go oh, point. Yeah. Okay. Come back. Cool. <laughs> uh, this is great. Sorry, guys. Thank you for bearing with me. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> okay. We just, um, you know, we have viewers at home watching this, so they need to be able fantastic. to hear you. <laughs> okay, cool. Lots of them, I'm sure. Sure you're thrilled. Uh, so, so just to give you guys a better idea as far as the interior of the building goes, uh, as my mother was explaining, if you follow my mouse over here, we've got the main bay door, which is right in front of this car. Uh, and that gives us access to uh, basically our online business. And a lot of this is warehouse space and office space. Um, there's actually behind this gate, which you saw in the previous pictures, there's another large door, uh, basically the size of a full bay. And when our interior construction is done, that's gonna be the only full size bay that gives us access uh, to the other side of this building. Um, it's the only thing that gives us access to the kitchen, our walk-in cooler, um, access to our grease trap. Um, so it's, it's, although we do have access to the front and we do have access to load certain things of certain size, if we lose the ability to back up into this area, it really reduces what we can do uh, with this interest, entrance, uh, in my opinion, at least. And I'll just add a couple of things. Uh, you've got a drawing in the back of this, and I'm sure you've been perusing this, looking at it. Um, there was, in the initial uh, phase of this, a doorway uh, that was from the warehouse area into the kitchen storage area. Uh, that doorway has been eliminated. Uh, OLCC did not want to have a doorway there. Do you have that drawing? Yeah, it's oh, on the okay. back of what they've oh, okay, got there. Uh, OLCC did not want to have that doorway there and have access from a warehouse in to the bar area. So that's been eliminated. So it really gives us absolutely no way of going from one side to the other uh, to get into the kitchen storage area. And I'll only add that, um, it, you know, if we were to have a, a breakdown, if we needed some maintenance, uh, electrical, uh, plumbing, uh, service with the cooler, uh, anything like that, uh, we would literally have to have a truck pull up 
and park in front of the entrance doors of this building <laughs> to be able to service this. And we've only got, once we put an ADA parking place up there, we'll have room for about two cars. So, uh, I mean, we would literally have to tell patrons, oh, you're going to have to move your car. We've got an emergency. You know, we've got some maintenance to do. And we don't have a way to get a truck back in here to come through those doors to service anything we have. So. I guess the one last thing I have to say is, you know, our tap room is approved for 60 people. Um, I don't know how it's going to cause a bunch of congestion because there is no place to park 60 cars or even 30 cars or even 10 cars. There's barely room to park five cars. So those people are going to hopefully come <laughs> and they're going to have to go somewhere and find a place to park or walk there. Hopefully we get a lot of you know people walking in. And um, But to think that this building is going to cause all this congestion, I don't know that the, if traffic, I don't know that that's going to happen. Um, certainly not like what's happening in front of the food carts because kids are jaywalking across there and everything. That is kind of a scary situation there. Um, but it doesn't start until after driveway A. I've been watching that, you know, and it, it really is, is past the building. Um, and I guess just another argument would be, you know, we're putting in the apartments behind there right across the street from the high school. My goodness, talk about congestion and, and danger. And here we are on a main wide highway that has clear visibility. And so we just would like, we just really need your consideration to have that access. I don't know how else to say it. It may not be an error. It's not perfect, but we really need it. And I think with what we have to offer for the community, I just really hope you'll consider that. That's Thank all you. I have to say. So I think we will ask you some questions. Okay. I think that's next. I want to make sure I'm following the right. I am sorry. About the right <laughs> procedures here. Um, do we can ask them questions now, right? Okay. The script is. So let's ask some questions. Anyone have any clarifying or? Yeah. We're going to start over here this time. I don't have any. You don't have any. No. What? Wow. I know. Yeah. Okay, you, that's, I don't believe it. No. Do any? Okay. Do we need to take a recess? <laughs> Do you think of some questions? Yeah. Um, so I, I think you're, you're aware that, you know, we're, we're here to look for errors in fact or law, um, mm -hmm. and that that's really the the extent of the decision that we've been asked to make, but the city's put forward an alternate path forward mm -hmm. with the um, opportunity to have a, a transportation study to kind of justify the, the second access. Is that something that you guys have thought about what that process would look like and are interested in pursuing? Well, you know, I don't we know whether we could afford it. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's not free, and we're sinking everything we got into this. I mean, that's, we'd have definitely, if you said no, we would be forced to consider it because it, it renders this property not useless, but it certainly wasn't the intention um, of it. And I don't know if we'd have another choice. I know you could take it to the Luba eventually. Um, I'm not that familiar with it. I just know that that's another process, so. Yeah, I think the question that, that we have is as to why uh, you know this this driveway once uh, had been there for years and then taken away and okay. then uh, the owner says oh you can't do that I don't have access to my building and then it was put back why is it not grandfathered in and can you just simply say if, if you wanted to yes it's grandfathered in go to work build a business mm -hmm. build the community I feel like we, a part of our responsibility to him is to try to keep that property intact, you know, for his investment as Did well. The responsibility to who? The the owner. We're buying the property from him, but that's going to be there for years and years. Yeah, and so he's carrying a paper on it. We're we're buying a building from him. He owns the deed still. The original owner. Okay. And so I mean, heaven forbid, if something happened where we could not follow through with our obligation to him, then he would be looking at a piece of property that is lesser than when he started because he lost that uh, driveway. And that's another reason I feel that 
you may not call it grandfathered in, but he still holds that property. You know, he has got more value in it, way more than we have. And so um, I'm trying to, you know, keep uphold that for him as well. And I had a, another question about, um, you made a comment about a ADA, mm -hmm. uh, you know, accessible parking, but the notes that we received from the staff um, stated that there, there has been no plan for parking on site. I think it seems to me that these are, um, you know, a as the application was submitted, these are more loading zones than parking spaces for a business. So I'm wondering where you're getting this criteria for the ADA parking, if that's something that someone's informed you of, or yes. you are assuming you would need to build. No, Samantha. Uh, Samantha? It, it's because of the, um, the, uh, the number of people that will be allowed in the building. So the, the, the city believe. has communicated to you that yes. ADA parking yes. will be required. Um, yes. I guess we'll, we'll want to ask the city about Unless that. Unless the, the we've misunderstood right. that and it's optional. Oh, no. She's, we, we actually had a meeting with her about it. And, and uh, she's you, absolutely... Yeah, talking uh, to the mic. i got a chip on my shoulder. you got to talk into the mic a little bit. So our at Sorry. home... Yes, we had, we had a meeting. My, my microphone is kind of low here, so... <laughs> Uh, need some new amplifiers. Anyway, uh, we had a meeting with Samantha uh, over at planning, and she indicated that we absolutely positively had to have one ADA parking place. And so we kind of did a little negotiation with her and asked whether or not the sidewalk area could be used as an exit if they were allowed to pull in through driveway B and then pull over and park fairly close to where the sidewalk was. Otherwise, we wouldn't have access for even one more car. <laughs> and so she said, well, I guess that's what you're going to have to do. Okay. So that's what we've been told. Okay. Um, and then just totally off script and selfishly family friendly or 21 and over for your uh, decibels? Uh, 21 and over. However, my heart out to students. I was an old jazz uh, person at Mount Hood Community College, and I would love to see if they have a jazz band or jazz singers or whatever come in and perform. And I don't know how we could finagle that with OLCC if they would give us an exception. Maybe we shut the bar down and close it up. It would be nice to be able to have give them access. And a secondary answer to that is that the outdoor area during the summertime will be all ages. Um, and so that will be accessible at that Thank time. Thank you for indulging me. <laughs> <laughs> so coming from a family of musicians, why we'd love We're to be able musicians. to do that. That's all the questions I had. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, Commissioner Burns essentially um, addressed my question, which was, um, you know, would, uh, I mean, given that, you know, our, the place that we find ourselves in is that we have very limited discretion uh, in our review. And so, um, and there is a path forward, a legal path forward, to, or a path forward to legalize the accesses that you have. And so, um, I mean, if, if we were to make a decision that, you know, that could be, that decision could be appealed to Luba, as you, you know, indicated that an unfavorable decision to you could also be appealed to Luba, but also, an you know, someone else could appeal our decision and say that we made an error in our interpretation of fact or judgment or, uh, or a legal judgment. And so, you know, we need to keep that, you know, I appreciate what you guys are trying to bring to the community, but, you know, we're in a position where this is a very legal and prescribed process. And so, um, you know, we need to be careful to act in, you know, the in accordance with the law. So, um, <clears throat> I had tried, um, before I wrote up the first appeal to get a hold of like a traffic a company or whatever that mm -hmm. analyzes that and they were out three months so that's why i rushed and wrote the first appeal hope i was hoping to have some something more solid to present to you and i don't know what is involved to get an engineer um to do this i guess my question would be how does this hang up the whole planning process? I mean, does this stop us from doing what we need to do in this building? Does it stop us from opening, or does it just hold up that driveway? And we'll have staff address that. Okay. When they come back up. Yeah. Okay. Did Commissioner Edge, did you have other questions? No, I, I, I will add, I appreciated your comment to a recommendation to reduce the speed limit to 15 miles an hour. Really I wish that we had the legal authority to do that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, and that, I'm glad you mentioned that because I swear somewhere in Milwaukee I saw a sign with a speed limit and I thought it was coming down onto like by the River Roadhouse, but I went and looked for it. I didn't see it where it said it reduced the speed because I got a ticket there once and it said uh, multiple entrances or exits, you know, watch for, and I was thinking, well, maybe that would be something we could put a sign up there. Um, I don't know. I really want the corner to look like a gateway into downtown Milwaukee. I mean, I, I envision plants and flowers and just when people come in around that corner, just, oh, wow, you know, this is cool. And then they hit the food carts and it's a, a cool place to be. Anyway. So then, um, would you be willing to extend the, uh, at, you know, the 120-day clock to, you know, continue to work with staff to figure out a path forward to? Um, well, I guess we need to know how, how that affects us going forward from here with the rest of what we're doing. Okay, we'll have staff address that. Okay, thank you. So, in in your application, you, um, I. To guess that you submitted to staff and talked to them about had like a food truck in that space. And so it sounds like though that your plans for that changed after you submitted the application. It did. Can you we talk were, a little bit about that? Yeah, we were working with um, one of the food carts and everything looked like it was going well, figuring out, brought them in, you know, you can use this or whatever, but uh, you can park here or there. And come to find out that person had a partner that we were not made aware of. And so when they spoke with their partner after we were getting ready to say, okay, let's do this, um, their partner said, well, I don't know what's going on. I don't want to be part of this. So now it's, um, we're looking at just developing a small kitchen, uh, nothing with open flame or anything, just as long as we meet the requirements to OLCC and, and have some nice, decent food and just do it ourselves. Okay. Um, yeah, that didn't work, unfortunately. We didn't want to be in the food business, so. Mm -hmm. We will probably be so. <laughs> And um, OLCC doesn't allow for like the proximity of those food carts to like count. It'd be people could no, like it was bring fine. in their food. No. It was fine. They could bring, you know, they, they you can't bring in the food to the. They uh, is it has to be on site to be for OLCC. Okay. Yeah, we do have an option of of looking for a, another food cart, uh, and we have talked about that uh, because I'm in the middle of plumbing and a everything for a commercial kitchen right now, for future. Mm -hmm. Depends on when that future arrives. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Commissioner Hamer, I'm really surprised here. Okay. Um, okay. So let's see. Do we have anyone who wants to testify? I don't have any yellow cards, but anybody? Okay. Um, now, let's see. Now we go to additional comments from staff according to this script. Does any sta do, does staff have any additional comments in response to the testimony? Um, if I could through the, through the chair. Um, I just wanted to um, clarify, and I, I'm, st I'm wishing that Samantha, our building official, were here, um, because I asked her very specifically about the ADA space question when I saw that in the, in the application. And what she indicated to me was, if you are formalizing parking spaces, then you need to have an ADA space. But that just by virtue, if you had no parking spaces on the site, an ADA space would not be required. Really? It's if you're formalizing any parking nice. spaces. So that was, um, so that was kind of, so understanding that, you know, an ADA space is only required if, if you're going to be creating parking spaces on the site. Well, that was, okay, so that was how she explained it. Is the definition of formalizing mean we're painting lines for cars to park? Correct. If you're creating parking on the site okay. that everyone that can see and can use kind of thing, then the ADA space would be required oh. because it's a proportion of the number oh, of spaces good. on the site. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, um, and Interesting. I, and I would, if just if we are talking about parking on the site and formalizing parking on the site, then um, staff will want to see how that is going to work um, to make sure that it meets our standards for size and, and that it's not located in a place that, you know, it, especially around um, Access B, um, if there are park, if folks are parked there, you know how does the entrance work? I mean, we'll just want to understand if you're if you want to propose formal parking spaces, then we'll just want to 
we'll want to understand where they're going to go so that we can just make sure that it meets our meets the design standards of okay so if it's unlined and first come first serve and then that's fine it will be very difficult to do your parking and keep the maneuvering on your property <laughs> so, i mean we know that <laughs> i i mean i don't think there's an option for parking on site, for legalizing any of the parking spaces on site. So you might be back at a variance if you wanted to put parking there, which, you know, it's another procedure, which you probably aren't interested in going through. Right, not at the moment. Um, okay. I, if that was it, I wanted to make sure well, that I, we had that. I had one other thing I noted yeah. as we were going forward here. Um, if they wanted to keep moving forward and do um, a closure and, and the commission were inclined to deny the appeal and they were allowed to keep going and pursue the modification, engineering would typically say before you're going to get any occupancy or, or do anything, you're going to have to put the, you're going to have to install those improvements to close the driveway. So I, I was thinking that we ought to try to figure out some type of a trigger mechanism that would allow them to continue forward um, if the commission denied the appeal tonight and let them um, essentially even operate while pending this this other decision. The, the, the tricky part there is um, figuring out the the mechanism, um, assuming if the modification wasn't granted, to then make sure that that closure happens. You follow, follow what I'm saying? We would normally require the closure to happen before occupancy could occur. That, that could look something like a, uh, a, a, a bond to the city that would right. be retained until the driveway is closed within yeah. 365 days or something, something or, like or an alternate approval is found, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. I, I want to, I mean, I, uh, engineering typically hates stuff like this. So <laughs> 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 uh, and 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 this guy's the guy that might have to. Oops, sorry. Ooh, that's a that's it's a okay. that's a uh, fractured collarbone I was messing with. There. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, you might you might be needed to help craft how that uh, that wording occurs. Sure. But that might be an option too. So you, if you follow what I'm yes, what I'm I saying do. that. Um, if if they deny it, we still might be able to hold and hold that open for you and not have to make that improvement initially. <clears throat> Would it be a condition based on a certain number of days? Yeah, I think that would we that be the easiest way to do it. We could probably do that. And then they have time to figure out which application they need to submit, and then assuming that gets submitted and processed and approved, then e it would never trigger the improvement. Right. I, a, sec, a certain number of days. I think that's probably the way we'd want to do it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any additional? Do you, do you have any other? Oh, can you talk about um, just timing in general? So the different pathways. So if we deny the appeal, what does that mean for the rest of the application and like timing and all that? Was it, it one of the concerns? If the appeal is denied, then the development review stands and that approval stands with its conditions and so on. Um, the, the building permit has been submitted and work is happening and, you know, we're sort of moving forward. And there is a certain number of certain kinds of improvements that were happening in the in the building that could be done without the development review anyway. So there was so that that could just continue to move forward. Again, the final occupancy permit is what would get held up traditionally um, without driveway C being closed. So you could kind of finish everything and then, you know, and then we hold up actually occupying the building, which doesn't make anyone feel very good. So I think that's where we've been talking about kind of this idea of the development review is done, things are happening under the building permit. Um, meanwhile, if the modification is being pursued with the engineering director and trying to work that part through, uh, then we build in an additional condition of approval, I think, through this that would get applied to the development review that would that would align um, with that modification process, knowing that that was going forward. So we could kind of keep everything moving forward um, until that modification 
and you know or the driveway situation is is resolved one way or the other and that way we're not stopping the you know them from being able to move forward and and continue on the project we don't want to do that no we don't but. want you to do that <laughs> We've got to make some money. Can't afford to do that. Yeah. Shut her down. So, what does a modification look like? I can't imagine what that would sense. look like. Yeah, you yeah. I think that maybe um, we were just saying maybe we should take a little recess and and talk a little bit more with staff. Does that okay. make sense? That you can, or you know, I mean, we were kind of into sort of a awkward place in the hearing where we're having this right. back and forth so I, we need I, to what we'd like to do is is try to craft a um a condition that okay. makes sense um, okay and uh but i think um the next step in the hearing is for um for the applicant to rebut and any the staff testimony and i was if if needed um, yes you're right but Thank i you. was it might make it might make sense for us to work out the condition so they can respond to the condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we'll have time for the applicant to make some final remarks. Yeah. Okay, just to stay with the process sure. and procedure here. So that's good. So um, what, five minutes? Five minutes. Can, okay. I, can I ask a question to staff before we break real quick? Yeah. Yeah. If I may, please. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, so uh, what uh, the applicant has, or the appellant, or whatever Us. the correct term is, um, they mark their uh, that square building off of the original building as office. If that had its own door and its own address, would that driveway C then have to exist? No. Doesn't it have to have street access? A par, a, they'd have to partition it, and we wouldn't allow a part. We wouldn't necessarily allow a partition without a shared access. At this point, and are we sure that that was never the case of why that driveway was there in the first place? There were driveways everywhere before there were curbs. Okay. All right. You know. Okay. But. Okay. So we're just going to take a five-minute break. That clock's I mean, it's throwing me off. So we'll come back at um, right before 7.45-ish, 7.44.
All right, so we are going to, we after the recess now, we're going to hear um, from staff about um, the, the new process and a new condition that can be put into this that, that talks about moving forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. So go ahead, okay. Denny. Okay, um, this assumes uh, denial of the appeal and a new condition that is added to the um, original approval. So within 180 days of the Planning Commission decision, the applicant must obtain approval of an access spacing modification that authorizes access from driveway C. If an access modification is not granted, the applicant shall permanently close driveway C per the public work standards. Can you read that one more time? Yep. Yeah, really. I'm gonna add with the. Um, within 180 days of the Planning Commission decision, the applicant must obtain approval of an access spacing modification that authorizes access from driveway C. If an access modification is not granted, the applicant shall permanently close driveway C per the public work standards, which would mean a curb. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions for staff before we turn it back to the appellant? For can I, can I ask just one really kind of goofy question? Mm -hmm. So uh, the sidewalk is built to uh, TriMet design standard, right? City standards. Uh, well, but the squares are a TriMet design, mm -hmm. right? Does, do they have to match that same pattern? All, with, all they'd be required to do is put in the... Um, the curbing. So all they do is actually put in a curb and then and pour some concrete over the top of it. Well, I don't know if the driveway is, uh, if the well, sidewalk. Well, I'm pretty sure the driveway is constructed to our south down to our downtown public area requirements. That's the right. two foot squares that we have. So they would. Oh, that is our standard. Yeah. Yeah. For uh, downtown. So their sidewalk would have to have those two square foot patterns in it. Uh, well, the only yeah, whatever they take out would go back in with that scoring pattern. And full height curb in front of it. Okay. Do we need to amend condition 1A to remove reference to driveway C? Yeah. So we're removing A. No, because it still applies to driveway B. Oh. Okay. So just the part that says um, removing easternmost driveway C and. Okay. So it would read sign driveway B as enter only. Okay. Got it. That makes sense. Um, okay. Anything else for staff? And then... The appellant has rebuttal and final remarks. So this is the last chance to ask staff any questions. We're good? Okay. Back to the <laughs> appellant. So you get to make a rebuttal to what we've just talked about and um, final remarks that you have for us before we then deliberate as a commission. Um, I get you're saying, who, we have to go get authorization for access. Who would authorize that if you can't authorize it? Who does that? It's the um, engineering director. It would be at this right now, it would be Kelly Brooks, who's assistant city manager and acting engineering director on the recommendation of the engineering staff. Um, Which would be based on the application requirements. Yeah. So it, it as was mentioned, it requires a, uh, a traffic um, engineer or transportation engineer's report mm -hmm. stamped mm -hmm. that it's appropriate. Okay. And so the time frame is that, you know, knowing that you said that you've looked and they're like three months mm -hmm. out, so that's the 180 days piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the one company. I think that's a company that uh, you guys use. That's where I got that name, so I called. Um, okay. Well, it sounds like we have no choice. Uh, <laughs> you're kind of in a rock and a hard place here. Um, 
I guess for what it's worth that that small little attached building does have its own door so I don't know if that ever was a separate location if there was anything that we could do that we are not aware of I would like to know that um, and again I guess I just have to stress that this driveway has been there for decades and all of a sudden this little patch has become a, a big issue and we've spent hours on it and you've spent hours on it and um, I my question also is if the city plan is to have businesses have their employees go to the outskirts for parking where is that going to be if we can't even use this little patch where are those people going to park how are you going to help other businesses um, you know because like I said this will trickle down if we can't park here or get access to it then all that's going to flow up to those, to those food carts or go under the bridge I don't know where they're going to park because it's two hour parking there so I mean there literally is no place to park unless you force cars up into neighborhoods and you've already got the apartments there I mean it's a real rat's nest becoming a rat's nest so people park on the lot every day i kicked somebody out again today mm -hmm. you know, and they park up on the side they park everywhere and they turn around it's a, it's a turnaround all the time actually the, what would solve that because people back into the driveway a turn around mm -hmm. probably at least 20 25 times a day sure. you know if that was one way going through there they'd never do that yeah we'd Food for thought about putting 21st one way going around the two-way streets and then making it by the post office and through that public square a one-way so that it, you just have this even for the safety of the students because mm -hmm. you know they're not going to quit jaywalking and at least that's one less direction <laughs> they would get hit from and then if people don't want to go that way then they would just go back up Lake Road but I yeah we've tr tried to figure out ways to make this work um, okay. yeah I got one question Oh, um, this is our daughter, I just, Sarah. Hi. I just wanted to revisit the working into the contract in some way, if that's what we do, the occupancy issue um, of addressing that. Of I know that we have the initial approval still, even if we have denial tonight. Um, and if we do go through the modification process and we reapply, of making sure that there is verbiage around, around that, because we just financially cannot survive without opening and generating some revenue as soon as possible um so i just want to make sure that that is an option well okay. the condition is drafted if the appeal is denied tonight your application is approved but without access through driveway c so what the condition allows you to do is 180 days after denial you can enter into the modification process and if that is ultimately successful you can retain access through through driveway C if that's not successful or you choose to not go down that route you can you can you'll have to close the the access to and, driveway C and what we had talked about and maybe you overheard heard this that the if you're ready to open sometime before, before that, then. you would get a, a, a temporary occupancy Absolutely. so that the, the hammer that the city would have for you to make that final improvement would be the permanent occupancy. Okay. Um, the other thing I might ask is if the three of you, or maybe, the, maybe it's four of you, could you guys all write your names down on a yellow sheet and turn them in so we have the record of who spoke? Sure. Sure. Thanks. Thank okay. you. Okay. Well, I guess I don't have anything else other than, you know, uh, can that uh, 180 days be made into 99 years? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we would appreciate that. Um, no. <laughs> and, um, Put some affordable housing on it and we'll talk. And, no. <laughs> and, uh, uh, if the if we go through the if we can afford to go through the process uh, for this uh, and it, and it is ultimately denied and has to be filled back in uh, can the city fill it back in for us so we don't have to pay to block our own driveway kind of like rubbing it in our face that, that's a discussion you'd have to have with city council mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. that, that may be true 
um, that would be unusual that we would um, <laughs> that we would do your frontage improvement. improvements. It, you know, it it, it when a, a property owner <laughs> makes changes to the property, that's sort of the the chance the city has to bring everything up to mm -hmm. up to the code. Um, standards so that's sort of what's what's happening here I mean it's sort of un, it is unfortunate in a way that a, a, a small business ends up getting dinged with some of those things here's a case where you know all the improvements were made just a few years ago um, but if it wasn't you guys coming in it would be somebody else and they would be basically and they'd be we'd be having the same discussion um, it would be a, it's just about the use of that particular site that it exists today as a vacant building really the only use that could go back in there and not trigger this improvement is the use that was there before the exact same use and uh, okay. i guess all i need to know then is if it all fails and how much is the uh ticket for hopping the curb yeah, yeah. No. I, you know um i don't know yeah, good question. <laughs> you know, would we'll you stop traffic if I have to do emergency maintenance, you know, and flag somebody in and, uh, that, you know? You know, that sort of thing happens sometimes. So, yeah, um, I could see making it happen. Since we're going to deal with engineers, is this something that they quote so we know what we're getting into? Or well, we have no idea. Not sure how that works. They, they, they would quote you for the service. Okay. And, you, and you're hiring a service when you okay. do that. And their service is to do the study and provide you a report findings with an engineering stamp. All right. Um, and you don't know anything about that little wedge that's... It's right away. Oh. A right away of what? That's part of Lake Road right away. There are you, was dedicated. Are you talking about the tiny triangle, so, right? The really, really small one. Oh, it was. Yes, right it now. was dedicated. Oh. It was. It was clear. It was dedicated off the high school property, um, to meet the center line dedication. But there was never a dedication off of the property that you're buying. So there was a wider, some at some point. The, the final cross section for Lake Road is what we have to the east with the center turn lane, and that's what Northwest Housing and also the high school will be constructing very soon is a little turn pocket oh, really? and wider road. Okay. Yep. Okay. Any final comments? We pre appreciate your Thank testimony. You. Thank appreciate you folks. All of it. And so um, with this, we're going to, um, do we, well, actually we do have an opportunity. So, so you, you guys can go from that seat. And then I, we have an opportunity to ask any additional questions of staff before I close the hearing. So I want to follow the procedure. Anyone have any additional questions from staff? We've had quite a back and forth here, but I think we're good. Want to check? Okay. So with that, the public testimony portion of this hearing on file on file um, AP-2019-002, an appeal of file DEV-2019-002 is now closed. I'll gavel. No further testimony can be taken unless the public hearing is reopened. Okay, ready for discussion? I, I have a question for our transportation expert. Um, is 180 days uh, reasonable? That's only about six months, so three if they're three there, months out there are quite a few firms that do that kind of study uh, right but uh wouldn't you assume that everybody's just as busy as everybody else in the country i don't assume business? anything because they because it's business they're not going to say no to business so I, I really don't know to be honest it depends some firms their niche is working with pri on private development issues so they're a little they have a little more kind of template to to get it done quick. Uh, how, how well how long does it take to do a study like that oh uh it would not take very long um i don't even they would probably look at the most recent counts i don't know if they would have to do new counts i don't think so so it could be done within a day probably um, it's it's not a full days. tis a yeah it's, this impact is impact a study. partial it's, it's a like memo. a supplemental kind of study so okay. it can be done pretty quickly mm. okay Good question. Anyone else? Discussion on this? Go ahead. Uh, I mean, this, this is uh, uh, 
A tough one because this is a, a small business and it's something that um, I, I think is really beneficial to the city of Milwaukee and aligned with the goals of the city and the goals of South Downtown and um, personally for me um, this you know I, I, I do walk by here every day um, to the train and I would visit this establishment um, on foot um, and so I'm just very very supportive and encouraged to see this kind of development and this kind of business coming into the city of Milwaukee um, and it is hard to see how um, what I think is a well-intentioned process and a reasonable process is impacting um, small business owners in a way that is, is hard for you to deal with um, but there are, you know, the process is the process, and we're here as, as volunteers to fill our role. Um, and I think we've done what we can to be creative and provide flexibility within the constraints of the, the process that we're a part of. Um, so I am not going to find that there are any errors in the city's analysis and um, decision of, of fact or law. Um, that is, the, the facts are the facts and the law is the law, and I think they've been applied appropriately. So I will be um, voting to deny the appeal, but very happy that we were able to do something for the applicant to get some flexibility into um, this case. I, I think it would be reasonable to go from 180 days to 365 days in my mind just to give the maximum amount of flexibility to find a, a low-cost engineer and to deliberate on what decision um, the, the applicant would, would need to make and to give some opportunity to open the business and, and generate the revenue. So I would propose that we go with a 365-day temporary certificate of occupancy rather than a 180-day certificate of occupancy as um, the, the city has proposed in their condition. But other than that, I, I think this is a denial of the appeal with the new condition as discussed. So uh, the, thank you for bringing that up. I was going to make the same suggestion. I, I think that I'm giving them enough time to, um, you know, figure out exactly how to move forward and, uh, you know, ultimately, um, you know, legalize the situation is, um, is in everybody's best interest. Um, <clears throat> uh, personally, um, I'm excited about having a high-end audio shop in Milwaukee. Um, I remember... <laughs> Uh, back in the 90s uh, when I was a teenager um, and I had to go to, you know, places in Lake Oswego that were only open on Saturday and Sunday by appointment yeah. or whatever. And and, um, and so this is this is really neat to uh, see, you know, this kind of uh, uh, this kind of shop coming to Milwaukee. Um, you know, it's a, it's a big change from 20 years ago. And so I, I think that's fantastic. But um, as far as this is concerned, uh, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, we are, you know, hemmed in uh, by the by the process. Um, there are no errors uh, in uh, staff's interpretation of the code um, or as a matter of law. So, uh, you know, we, we really are not in a position to be able to uphold the appeal. Um, but uh, I'm glad, I'm, I really am I'm thankful that uh, the applicant was willing to um, kind of consider, you know, alternatives and have a discussion with staff and that we found a way that we can, you know, move forward where, um, you know, we're not, uh, we're not setting this in stone quite yet, but we are able to get their doors open um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and resolve this, this matter, you know, ultimately a, a little bit later. So um, I also will be voting to um, deny the appeal and uphold the original decision with the conditions that we've already discussed with the amendment to 365 days as uh, recommended by Commissioner Burns. Okay. I'm going to align with the, the, suge the suggestion to amend our provision to 365 days. Okay. It is a good question about the intensity of business right now. Didn't want to discount that. In fact, we can all probably reflect that there's so much development going on in the area. That is a function of how busy that these kinds of firms are. So 365 days is, is a good thing to do. Um, it ins ensures that we know construction season is so intense that uh, this should help uh, be able to give them. Also, they need to know they can do be consumers and choose between firms that would offer different uh, bids uh, and uh, including how fast they think they can turn it around. So I'm, I'm inclined to uh, do the denial and then uh, approve um, conditions as written, but with the 365-day amendment. Uh, I'm in agreement with that. I think the 365-day uh, TCO is reasonable. Um, and I'll just add, too, that I live in the area, and I, I'm re really excited to hear that um, 
it's kind of a unique unique business but um i think it would be great for the area Thanks yeah i i i wrote down 240 days on my paper and that's why i was <laughs> trying to get uh, uh, commissioner argo to to get me to to be able to push a longer date so i am way for 365 the uh, the reason why uh, is that uh, this is an expensive rules are rules and they are sometimes they're just crummy and uh, I don't think that the city made any error in judgment um, but I, I think giving this small business a chance to build some revenue because it's not cheap and it won't be it won't be inexpensive um, and I worry about the process oh well if it takes uh, four months or five months to get their report, then they got to go hand it into the city engineer, uh, where we may have a new head city engineer at that point in time, and things may just get pushed, and then all of a sudden, uh, Alex comes rolling up to him and says, uh, you guys are close. So I like the 365 days, gives them a chance to build up some revenue and get quotes for uh, doing the concrete and uh, getting their trans uh, transportation plan too. Okay. Well, it sounds like we're all in agreement. So with that, I would entertain a motion. <laughs> it's tricky to, it's tricky to do these. We saw you Normally I'll jump down, on Adam. it, but this one's way too complicated <laughs> for me. Do we need to read the condition, the amended condition into the record? Oops. Oh yeah, let's do that. Cause I don't have that written in front of me. Okay. So, um, Let's see, uh, I don't have the full thing. Uh, Chair Travis, yes. you could have Denny enter it, read it into the record for us. Yes. Please, Denny. You guys want to make a motion first and then I, and then I'll. And then yeah, you'll, so. then we'll say we approve with the yeah. commission. Yeah. Okay. And so there I'm, was another change that you needed to make. You needed to drop the first part of yeah. 1A, 1A. Clause, yeah. first clause. Um, so I'll, I'll move that we um, deny the appeal and uphold the original decision um, for application uh, DEV-2019-002 uh, with amended conditions um, 1A uh, as discussed earlier, which removes the reference to removing easternmost driveway C and with the new condition that Denny will read into the record. Okay, that condition is within 365 days of the planning commission decision the applicant must obtain approval of an access spacing modification that authorizes access from driveway C. If an access modification is not granted, the applicant shall permanently close driveway C per the public work standards. I need a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, the, let me read the, um, this decision is the city's final decision on file DE-2019-002 and is not appealable to Milwaukee City Council. Further appeals of this decision may be made to the Oregon Land Use Board of Appeals or other court. Please see planning staff for details. Okay. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we, you we, will get a notice of decision, notice of decision that states that and lists the condition. Vera, Vera will send that out and pr probably tomorrow. Let's not have, we can't have you talking to Denny like this, sorry. So we'll, um, you guys can chat a little bit after, but we will get the information to you and then you'll have an opportunity to further discuss. So, okay, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You very much. Okay, so um, back to the agenda. Next on the agenda, we have work session item with David. Thank you, Chair Travis, uh, Commissioners, David Levitan, Senior Planner here to uh, provide a brief update just on some of the work that we've been doing on uh, the housing block of the Comprehensive Plan Update, as uh, Denny had mentioned during his staff updates. Um, April is definitely where we're 
really getting into the housing discussion. So I'm going to touch briefly on what we've been working on lately um, and then talk a little bit about the town hall and the online open house that will be going on towards the latter part of the month. And um, we're going to give you a little bit of information and then ask you some questions as well. So, um, so as part of that, uh, I'm going to have Denny kind of tackle um, that second bullet point, which is kind of discussing growth limitations and how much growth we should plan for. Um, we'll try to keep that as streamlined as possible. Okay. <laughs> questions? I need to laugh about that. I'll, I'll share more details about that. <laughs> Anyways, so um, as far as kind of work that we've done in the past couple of months, uh, we've had two housing advisory committee meetings. It's basically a subcommittee of the comprehensive plan advisory committee, but it basically is the exact same membership just because we have such a group of eager, be eager beavers on the CPAC that they all decided that they wanted to serve on the housing committee as well. Um, Commissioner Edge filled in for Chair Travis at that first meeting. Um, and... Um, in addition to that work on the Housing Advisory Committee, um, we've got a lot of different housing projects going on. Um, kind of have an, We have an equitable housing study that's funded by a DLCD grant that's going to feed directly into the Comprehensive Plan Policy Development. Uh, we have Angelo Planning Group helping us out with that. They're also our general consultants on the Comprehensive Plan. Um, and then um, we have a Metro grant through their equitable housing uh, grants um, that's funding a feasibility analysis of cottage cluster development. Um, and then we're also using the same consultants to do kind of an ADU code audit um, and propose some potential code amendments to our ADU code. Um, and so you'll be meeting with a uh, joint meeting with the city council on April 16th. Um, to kind of discuss those two projects um, as you look through the upcoming meetings. And then obviously April 18th is our big housing town hall for the housing block of the comprehensive plan update and that's gonna be the focus of the, the latter half of this presentation. Um, so I'm gonna let uh, Denny talk about um, these slides. Uh, they basically deal with kind of planning for growth and how, we, how should we be having that discussion with the community. Well, we'd been struggling with somewhat with how to frame some of the discussion. And um, as we also started in on the public facilities section, asking questions about are there, are there limits to the amount of growth that we can um, deal with here in, in Milwaukee. And one of the, the true limitations are the, um, the amount of capacity at the Kellogg treatment plant. And the um, current use at that plant is 35,000 EDU or equivalent dwelling units. So that includes, you know, housing plus commercial <coughs> and industrial. And, the, um, and about a third of that usage currently is industrial or commercial. Um, the maximum capacity, design capacity for that plant is 40,000 EDU. So we've got about a, a 5,000 EDU um, ability to grow. What that translates to in terms of dwelling units is somewhere between 3,500 dwelling units and we made an estimate trying to adjust some of the, the numbers um, uh, four point, you know, four thousand three hundred dwelling units, and that's sort of the target number that we're we're thinking about right now as our dwelling unit growth capacity with the with this treatment plant. This assumes that um, the city captures basically all of the growth potential from the plant. Can you go to the next slide? And that um, the growth in in Happy Valley and in much of the county area that's unincorporated is sent down to the Tri-Cities plant via the Intertie um, pump station, which is out near the community college. So the, the drainage basins here is most, most of the uh, of Happy Valley and most of um, 
a, a good portion of unincorporated Milwaukee actually can can be um, sent down to the Tri Cities plant. So, but it's currently not right. No, a lot of it is. Oh, it is. I, I'm, almost all of Happy Valley is currently okay. going down right. there. There's, I think, uh, there is a, there is a portion of it that goes to um, the uh, the Kellogg plant. And, and does does this count uh, all of the uh, people in our uh, GMO or GMU or the UGMA? UGMA. The um, it, most of the uh, not all of the UGMA, but um, I'd say there's probably. Another 20,000 people that live out in the UGMA area, and um, currently most of that is being treated at the at the treatment plant today. At the Milwaukee. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Most of it. Um, so I'm trying to describe this in in um, sort of general terms, and and I, but I think the concept of saying that the growth capacity of that plant represents our growth capacity is probably a, a, a good limit without, I mean, the, the option there is to expand that plant, to do more to expand the plant, um, or to create new pumps that would pump from our treatment plant back up to intertie to, that, that line is is supposed to be expanded um, to basically take all of of uh, the Happy Valley growth. So there's just, that's going to be a humong, ultimately it will be a humongous pipeline or a couple of pipes. Uh, the, so what we, what we were attempting to do with this is define some scenarios for that growth. And um, so the exercise to, to do this would be to allocate those 4,000 plus dwelling units to the city um, and include a sort of a base case scenario and then three other scenarios for evaluation and then evaluate each of those scenarios with, a, with an evaluation lens. One that would look at equity issues, the other affordability, um, and then sustainability and livability. And we've been working on some draft criteria to fit with each of those, that it does, yeah. There's, we've been there's making yeah. some additional evolutionary moves since that first right. draft. Yeah. But the same idea is that same basic idea. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the 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 scenarios that um, we've landed on right now are uh, a base case, which under that base case, our current buildable lands inventory assumes we could accommodate about 2,900 dwelling units. So a good portion of that 4,300 we're already zoned for. Um, doesn't mean we want to, we could shift some of that around if we needed to and with, through this camp comp plan process. But um, what we were thinking about is there's maybe three other scenarios to test out with folks. One being sort of the shared missing middle approach, the, the idea of putting missing middle throughout the community, another being a center's focus, and a third being a hub and corridor focus. Um, we're going to end, I think we'll end up doing some cartoony kinds of concepts with each of these that would take, that we could take to um, the open house and talk about these with people to, to kind of get the idea. But here, the, you know, these would be the areas where you would allow some form of missing middle under under that scenario. Um, I'm sorry, Dave, could you please give a definition of missing middle? Um, the, the, the form of missing middle that we are talking about is anything from a triplex um, to a cottage cluster to potentially a fourplex or some type of a could be a, could be even so. Is the dollar that. range a hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars? Is or don't you think in terms of if in ownership in, in an ownership? Yeah, price. Mode, it's price. probably uh, I don't know two hundred and up. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, or, do, I or does that not fall within the definition? It uh, it's it doesn't deal with income. It right. deals with basically the 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 categories of housing that fall between kind of single family and duplexes and then going up to multifamily is kind of in between. It's, it's like stacked kind of the, apartments. Yeah, so it's, it's basically 
categories of housing kind of in between multifamily and single family. Okay, so thank you. It's, it's, it's missing middle because what's allowed now is basically from like a, um, a mid rise and to more dense or a single family or duplex and less. Y you gotcha. know, it's okay. what's in the middle there. Okay. That's what's All right. missing. All right, thank you. And then the, the final scenario being sort of a hubs and corridors. So looking at where we've identified hubs, where we've got opportunities along some of the corridors, this would be, you know, the Harrison King corridor and the um, 32nd Avenue corridor, some along Lake. Um, there might be other, other options there, but I just threw some visuals together quickly to try to describe uh, um, each of these. So that's, so we, what we were thinking about is an exercise at the open, the, at the open, or the town hall that would um, include these different scenarios and ask people to go through the evaluation process. And that's, that's an option. We're not 100% wedded to it. It's one of the things we're thinking about. And David's got some other items that he will address yeah so i'll just walk through a, a Denny, couple more first things. i just want to say that was that was a lot better <laughs> it was i didn't have anybody asking questions about edus and oh boy yeah we spent a good 30 minutes this on is that. why you put this at the end of the meeting instead <laughs> of at the beginning no that went way that went, well, you I, had a well, test run there I with the cpac I, I didn't go into any of the detail that i went into with the yeah. committee yeah and this it was way better <laughs> The man, loves, the man loves his housing capacity. It's, uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, just a little bit more on that town hall, you know, kind of obviously April 18th, 6 to 8 p.m., kind of with all this information and kind of this discussion of scenarios and alternatives and lenses, um, you know, we envision that we're going to need to have at least some sort of introduction. Um, so we, we're working on the programming of that. We know that it's kind of a fine line between talking at them for too long when they're kind of chomping at the bit to get into small group discussions versus kind of leaving them clueless and just saying, okay, let's, let's get ready to talk. So we really need to, we're going to be working on that. Um, and then the things that we really want to be tied to, um, obviously the community vision, uh, what we heard at the, at the last CPAC meeting, the housing committee meeting was, you know, we don't need to be like reinventing the wheels, creating all sorts of categories and spending a lot of our time on that. We have a pretty clear vision in the community vision that talks about increased affordability and more housing options and sustainable development, incorporating that. So we want to make sure that what we're discussing is, is you both through that lens and then also the the lenses that Denny discussed as far as affordability, equity, sustainability, and livability. Um, our intern Tay is, is working on kind of a one pager on that to really make that clear and to show kind of that nexus between, um, you know, this housing discussion and, and these lenses. Um, and so I'm not going to touch on this too long because Denny uh, talked on this, but the scenarios just as far as how we would be accommodating growth and then also, you know, using those filters to kind of look at some of the benefits and drawbacks of each scenario as it relates to affordability, equity, sustainability, and livability. Um, and then in addition to kind of supplement that is we really want to be people thinking about, you know, those benefits, those drawbacks, really what are the trade-offs kind of for these different scenarios and for these different options. So looking to supplement kind of the scenarios uh, with specific questions for people to to consider and we're working on those questions now and we would appreciate any feedback that you have any kind of ideas that you really think we should be asking the community when we're discussing this concept related to growth um you know could be set up as like a sliding scale or an order of importance we're still kind of finalizing all this we have a whopping 23 days to get this done so we're in good shape um but uh, we're, as I said, we're working on those potential questions and would, and would love to get your feedback. So we're just going to kind of include a, just a couple of examples. These aren't, um, you know, complete in, in any way, just examples of the type of things that we were thinking about. Um, Can I throw something in yeah. real quick? The other thing that we are um, going to do with the open house, just like we have with the others, is we'll have an online version. So we've been trying to think about questions and... and um, processes and that that work either in in person or um, electronically so the some of these trade-off questions could be kind of would be um, things that might work really well online who 
who's your consultant on that? On the who would be doing the online? Um, the Envi Enviro issues. Enviro issues. Done the, the others. So they've probably done a few of these. Yeah. So they have a, I think, actually a proprietary yeah. model that oh, they yeah. use. Um, and I know they've done a bunch of work with the state. I don't oh. know if with yeah. ODOT, but um, yeah. Well, they worked on CRC. Okay. And so just kind of some of the things to be thinking about, the first one kind of really gets into um, kind of the scenarios question just as far as kind of um, additional, you know, providing opportunities for additional housing types in all areas versus near transit and services. And then kind of you can imagine how the equity um, component of that as far as making sure that people that are, you know, if additional people are coming in and there are additional housing types, make sure that they can afford, you know, to live there, that we're not just kind of, marooning them in a traditional d detached single family residential neighborhood without you know good connections to transit um you know a lot of what we hear um relates to kind of neighborhood character which is kind of hard to define and so this is going to be a bit of a tricky one um but you know preserving very visual and neighborhood character versus increasing design flexibility and affordability as you're introducing these new housing types um you know, maintaining private open space. Uh, we have a lot of obviously large lots still, especially compared um, to kind of other cities. Um, and as we start to, and we're, we're dependent obviously on infill development. Um, so what are the benefits, the trade-offs, the drawbacks? Um, you know, how do we evaluate offering these additional housing types that are gonna help to fill in some of these sites that maybe aren't feasible with a flag lot? Um, the exchange for that is obviously less kind of open space than people are have been used to over the last couple of decades. Um, and then just a general um, concept of housing affordability and what kind of goes into that and what the potential impacts of additional design requirements and sustainability components, um, at least in the short term, you know, what, what impact those have on housing affordability if we're going to be you know, this is thinking a little bit more down the line as far as implementation, as far as actual code language and program re program requirements. But, you know, how much of that do we want to layer on versus kind of focusing on the housing affordability issue first and kind of kind of tapering that in at a later date? Um, and so we're continuing to kind of work on these questions. We have a couple additional opportunities in the next week. Um, we're going to be discussing with this, them with the CPAC on Monday, and then we also have a check-in with the city council on Tuesday. Um, and so really what we're looking for you tonight is just kind of general feedback on the approach to the town hall. Um, you know, if you obviously live here. Um, you know, your neighbors live here, um, have had a lot of, you know, interactions, I'm sure, related to housing. It's been a very hot button issue for the last several years. Um, you know, so what types of questions would be helpful to ask? Um, you know, we want this to be very easy, as easy as possible to like portray visually. So, you know, what types of graphics and materials do you think would really be useful for us to have when we're trying to get across these messages and these concepts without just talking at people for, you know, hours and hours. Um, and then we would love, obviously, for all of you to be there, um, you know, and, and at past meetings, um, I know several commissioners have stepped in, whether it was planned or not. Um, but I think this is definitely an area where you have a lot of expertise and where you're going to be providing, um, you know, the, all, all of this work is going to be coming back through the planning commission and it's going to hopefully be reflective of community input and feedback. So we would love for you to be involved at the town hall. So with that, I would kind of just leave it up for general discussion and kind of general feedback on, on what we've presented. Can we go? Uh, just quickly, get, just, just so I can remind her, what kind of horizon year have we continually kept people toward in looking at our comprehensive plan? Well, it's been a 20 year just horizon. 20. But, but in the, scenarios, what I sometimes you want to go farther. It, it goes beyond yeah. the 20 year time okay. frame. But I think it's a, it, it, it provides us with a um, sort of a target, mm -hmm. at least in the, yeah. you know, for now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there are 10,000 dwelling units in Milwaukee right now. Is that? About, yeah. About 10,000. Okay. And, and about ten thousand out in the, out in the, uh, urban urban growth management area. Okay. Um. Okay. 
just wanted to clarify. So um, I think it's fantastic that we're looking at the trade-offs uh, of these, and um, I, I want to, I know this, these are, everything is so entangled. Um, you know, I want to avoid being too simplistic, you know, with the trade-offs, because we need to know there are cascading effects to um, certain trade-offs. <laughs> and so, you know, it's not simply, you know, oh, how does it affect affordability or, you know, I mean, there's, you know, with when you have more people in single-family dwellings spread out throughout the, you know, the neighborhoods, you have more people driving, you have more people getting hit by cars, you have more people, you know, I mean, it's, there's, there's a lot going on. Um, that are impacted by these choices, and um, and we need to avoid being too. I, I mean, I, I don't want to. I don't want people to be overwhelmed by too much information, and so that's a really that in itself is a you know a, a balancing act. But um, but we need to make sure that we're not being too simple about you know these choices. These are not purely aesthetic choices. You, you know, I mean, there's there's really a lot that's impacted by. The decision to you know really concentrate people in corridors versus you know spreading people out um, throughout throughout neighborhoods. Um, the uh, <clears throat> the other um, the the wrench and maybe this isn't going to be something that we need to address necessarily by the the forum, but the the wrench in in the growth scenarios and growth limitations is the risk of a uh, of a climate disruption related pulse event that displaces tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people um, up into this region and that we don't have, you know, I mean, that will impact our housing. Housing is, housing policies will not be independent of the impacts of a pulse event of that nature. And so um, we need to have a contingency plan for, you know, and, and this is a regional question, uh, obviously. You know, we, we hadn't really spent too much time talking about um, the limitations of our utilities, uh, you know, with the, the respect to growth um, up to this point. I mean, we a little bit at the last meeting, but um, we haven't really gotten into that as a group yet. And so, um, you know, that's a, that's a big question. And to have only, you know, 5,000, you know, dwelling units or, or whatever it was of capacity to be able to add is, um, I mean, that's that's not very many. And um, and so we we will we should be making sure to to be considering you know how do you respond to that limitation when you know the the demand is not necessarily going to wait for this that 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 need that facility to be improved to, to provide so um, you know whether it's different standards you know whether it's more um, you know I don't know maybe we can. Maybe we can look more into the the living building or uh, institute um, standards, or, or you know some of these more advanced you know uh, standards, and see what are our other options for wastewater reuse and you know other things that could take pressure off of the utilities. And I know that there's a certain amount of that that's probably you know state code or you know whatever, but um, but we really need to be looking at how do we maximize the capacity that we have, and how do we um, absorb on short notice a huge influx of population um, that even if it's distributed across the entire metro area, there's going to be you know a lot that gets here, and you know maybe it comes in a few waves over five or ten years or fifteen or twenty years, but that's that's not a lot of time to to you know add another digester or whatever to add a lot of capacity at at a plant, which is a huge expense and a huge construction project and and everything, and so we just really need to you know be considering that as we move into buttoning down these policies, um, we need to have some idea of what our, our contingencies are um, and, and really be setting ourselves up towards um, being able to maximize the capacity we have. Yeah, and a pulse event obviously is very hard to predict and to plan for just because you don't want to be planning for a worst case scenario, because when, especially when you don't know that. I would point out, I mean, if we do have increased, you know, in migration and whether it's related to climate change or not, um, you know, our, our our zone capacity is based off like the the buildable lands inventory that Denny mentioned is kind of based on you know it's a it's a formula it assumes kind of a land to improvement value 
I mean, if we have a lot of people wanting to move here, the BLI is going to show a lot more capacity because, you know, basically it's it's going to make more sense to be redeveloping and right. do infill development if your land is worth a whole lot more than your building. Um, and so if your improved value is only 150000 all of a sudden your land goes from 300000 to 800000 well, you're going to start building stuff. And so... Um, and selling it off. And so, um, you know, our plan is to, you know, on the comp plan side of things is not wait another 30 years before we do this again. I think we're going to need to obviously update our policies, especially if we kind of see the writing on the wall, you know, related to that. So I think there will be the, the public public facilities component is a little bit harder because um, that's obviously much more expensive than us just changing our zoning or changing the permitted housing types. Um, you know, accommodating that growth will be, it'll be a struggle. I mean, if it does ramp up quickly, so. We've, we've got water capacity to just about double. Right. And the, um, the, the sewer capacities that is the, the key limitation. And there's still probably opportunities to stretch that through some gray water programs, making sure that new development ends up doing a better job of kind of managing, managing that, doing some things with infiltration and, and, um, and some of the pipes. Although most of what we were looking at were dry water, there, there are dry weather flows and it's the wet weather where, when you've got those types of infiltration problems primarily. But there are, are things like that that will help expand capacity. Um, the mayor at the last meeting talked about, well, there could be technological changes as well that kind of help. And all of that's true, you know, but, but uh, it, does, um, it does sort of make sense also to sort of do our planning with some knowledge of the limits and to kind of keep that in, in mind as we move forward. Can we kind of think of it that I know we, we have a base case and then those four mm -hmm. uh, different scenarios with a pulse event, are we, can we at least look at say, what is a, a an absolute threshold on an, on a pulse or an emergency, a kind of disruptive event versus a threshold we're assuming when we explore the futures off of our baseline? Well, scenario. Well, I think, you know, right now we've got kind of a, hard, a really hard line of of five thousand EDU. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, with with more time, you might sure. there might be more flexibility in how you would approach that. Okay. So, you know, if if growth rates just suddenly ramp up, I'm I'm not sure. You not know. sure. But I would note that we're going to be updating, you know, several of our utility master plans. Um, and, you know, Peter Passarelli, the public works director, obviously was the project manager for the climate action plan as well. He's very mm -hmm. much knowledgeable about this and has very, you know, serious concerns about it. And so, you know, we would have, we potentially could talk to him. You know, they, they always evaluate multiple, you know, scenarios within those master planning documents. There would be one where we kind of, like, what's our kind of worst case scenario and what what do we need to do on the utility side of things as i said i think the utilities are going to drive this a lot more than the housing the housing you know the zoning is something that we can accommodate on a relatively mm -hmm. quick you know time frame compared to well how are you actually going to serve all these houses and so um G getting at what you're talking about with you need something that shows you differentiation and and real types. I, I won't guess Enviro issues is secret factory of, of scenario planning, but what you typically will see is that with those four different kinds of scenarios, and then you saw the, we had four values of, of that we measure them across. You tend to know that, like if you look at it in a slider bar sense, some of the, one of those scenarios probably can go far on one slider where the others will go not in a different way so part that can sometimes be how i've seen them do it in a also a public online uh, sense so that people understand okay i have i do have constraints to work within and that does show the differentiation with because it's, it's what you're loading your value to so maybe maybe that'll be kind of how they frame the exercise. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure, but that's useful because people understand that that means different choices mean different things. Yeah, I'm not 100% certain what all those options might be, but but um, they're not just going to 
do this magical thing for us. We're going to be right in the middle of kind of designing it. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I've started on is to try to look at what each one of those means in terms of um, how much and how what type of growth it is, how much single family does it represent, how much multifamily, how, uh, you know, as opposed to, uh, um, and it, it would vary depending on which one you're, you're picking. Yeah. So. It's fun stuff. Yeah. I hope we're all there. So are you going to be using this or some form of this? What, what well, happens I, to this? I, honestly, I think that is a excellent starting point to take off into policies. But it, um, we, we aren't quite sure how we're going to use that. I think mm -hmm. what we've tried to do is simplify it at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's probably going to be... I mean, there's a lot of lot of really good stuff on here. I really, really appreciate this matrix. I think it's great. But yeah, it's there's a lot going on in here, and to have it, um, you know, there, I think there are questions. What a question that I appreciate on this is: Will increased development and property values result in displacement or gentrification? If so, how do we combat it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I I would. There will be some people in the room that have never, ever even thought of this right. question. And there are many people who have spent lots of time thinking about this question already. So I guess, you know, kind of like, how do, how do you meet people where they're at, which may be at the very entry level, because they haven't been participating in a lot of these housing conversations. You know, they're going to come to the town hall to get the information. So, but then there's been a number of people who have been in these conversations too. So I guess, you know, you want to allow the idea you know, as you allow that exchange between people at their tables to be able to talk about that kind of stuff. But I guess, so like, it's education about some of these things that are in conflict with another or scenarios that have these trade-offs. Um, yeah, so how do you do it in a way that isn't too overwhelming in that kind of format? Like hone in on like really some of the key things. Like I think that that is a really great, um, question um, and and like thought provoking kind of discussion generating sort of question um, I think another one is and this builds off of there was a survey on neighborhood hubs right did people do an online survey about neighborhood hubs we did yeah okay so I mean naturally to me I think that you would want to build off of that data collection that you've already done so a simple thing is should there be additional density in areas around neighborhood hubs you know that you know, you know we've had some of that discussion in the neighborhoods and yeah. and so there's a sort of a wide range of opinion about yeah. which some of the hubs absolutely and some of them not so much yeah. you know so there's this kind of so there's already been some exchange there has at that and, and it's level. like i think we know which ones kind of make sense to like tweak up yeah. and the others are probably a really long-term project. Yeah. You know? Right. Um, yeah, so then you'd want to, like, make sure that you share what you already, like, here's up to date, that we've had these discussions, here's what we know, kind of building off of things. So, anyway, I just wanted to highlight a, a few things, um, but I think, all in all, there's a really great um, stuff in here. I mean, another one, does increased affordability have to mean increased density? These are just really good, great, you know, great thought-provoking questions. Um, I mean, I don't know the answer to that, so I'm like, can we talk about that one? Um, you're so the host, you're the housing expert. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. So anyway, I guess I just would encourage some, you know, effort around like using this stuff in a way that makes sense for varying audiences. But the, to then foster that exchange at the tables where somebody who's v brand new to the conversation can learn about the topics from their neighbors so that you're not talking at them, like you said, that's a problem, where you're educating them, but instead allowing the good discussion for neighbors to educate everyone. Yeah, so I think that introduction is going to need to be obviously pretty succinct, but cover as many things as possible just because there are going to be a wide variety of of you know backgrounds and levels of knowledge related to these issues i mean even just saying gentrification i mean you can't assume that everyone knows what that is yeah, that's, um, that, yeah. my point um, as being the average joe 
okay? Don't use words like uh, uh, gentrification. Don't use words um, like uh, affordable um, because those are uh, even middle level housing. Yeah. It's a definition that the common person has no clue what that means, but they have an idea in their head. And so what you should do is you should not use that word, but give the definition when you're asking the question. I think we'll try to provide some imagery to go along with things, too. I, so. My suggestion is don't even use those words, because what happens is, is that it, it triggers something into uh, in, in, in somebody's mind that may not be what you're trying yeah. to get across. So, like, for me, when I think of housing, <clears throat> excuse me, I think of in dollars. I mean, that's, that's just, I'm an economic-driven kind of guy. I think of in dollars. So when somebody says middle-level housing, the immediate thought is, oh, well, it's got to be 100, <clears throat> 100 grand to 250, which it may not be because we all know that housing is based on a very simple fact that it's just supply and demand, and it can be any price, no matter what. Um, a 2,000 square foot house on Stark Street sold for $750,000. 2,000 square foot house in Milwaukee, you're lucky 350, 450, right? So I mean, it's a big difference. And I think some of it is, is that uh, um, the average uh, person may be worried that we are trying to solve a regional problem at a local level. And that's why I'm so glad to hear the capacity number because now that can't happen. And so um, what I, I think that you kind of also need to separate out those regional issues, like gentrification is such a regional uh, uh, term. Um, and then you can, by just not using it, it actually helps it at the local level. And so um, when you talk about affordable housing, um, when you talk about equitable housing, the first thought that I thought, well, well the most equitable thing is just the government buys everybody's house and we all get to live here for free. That's the most equitable thing we can do, right? But that's not what that definition is. And so that's why you kind of got to say what it is without actually even giving it a title. And I think that will help everybody understand, especially during your surveys. Yeah, buzz, buzzwords can be really hot button. Um, and they can invoke a visceral response um, that is not always accurate. Right. And Because so they don't get what it really, yeah, nobody you know, understands what it really means. Yeah. Okay, but you want the regional, bringing up region, you know, the regional um, aspects is another thing I wanted to mention is that it probably is, it would, it would probably be beneficial to, because again, with the, the issue with the city is that, you know, we haven't really seen a population increase, you know, very much. We haven't really added that many dwelling units. It's, it's um, but th there's growth in the region, you know, and, and there's so much growth in the region that it is impacting the affordability of the residences that are here. And so there's there's no decoupling of the local and the regional, y you know, I mean, there's, to a certain extent there, there is, because we have our own capacity and we have our own utilities, we have, you know, whatever, but, um, but the, the, the market dynamics are really something that happens at a, are influenced at a regional level. And so knowing that, you know, we're still growing at a certain rate, even if we can only add 5,000 dwellings, the region is still growing at a certain rate and that's going to have, you know, that's going to have an impact on, you know, what dwelling, you know, the cost of the dwelling units that we have and are able to add. But, but see, so I, th this is, this is going to be part of my argument is that don't forget, for the majority of the people that live here, <clears throat> house pricing increasing is a very positive thing. Don't, right, right. I mean, really, yeah. the statistic okay. is, is that the average Milwaukeean only spends 26% of their household income on housing. Okay, that, that's, so really, the best case scenario is do nothing if your threshold is 30. We're worried about uh, the low income, right? And we're worried about people that are going to be able to come and move in here. So when we talk about that, um, the housing pressure is not a bad thing to most people. And when it's framed the way that you said it, you didn't intentionally do it, but when you say it that way, right, Somebody that's just sitting there in the audience is going to say, <clears throat> here we go again. The people here in Milwaukee are going to get screwed because we're doing something for people that don't live here yet. 
Uh, I'm just I'm, so I'm I mean, about half the people own, and about half the people rent, and about half, and the, the half of the, the about half the people that rent don't benefit from the same price mechanisms that the people that about half the people that do own are benefiting from. Yeah, but the number isn't fifty-fifty. It's 60-40 at least. It's about 60-40. It's not an insignificant number of people that live here and, and, uh, I'm and not, vote. Uh, well, and, uh, uh, right. Uh, I get that. I mean, and, and the most equitable thing to do in the spirit of equity as we are using it in the, you know, today is to help the people who are the have-nots. Uh, I'm just saying Not to just help everybody, uh, no, but to really focus on helping people uh, who are disadvantaged. I, I understand and completely, totally get your argument. And so it's really important that we actually do argument. more to I benefit renters but don't and forget, homeowners. But don't forget that there is that other side of the coin that if you choose to ignore, uh, you end up with uh, not really actually an equitable decision. It's more one-sided. Well, I think the, the response and what we need to, you know, make clear with people is, you know, no matter what we come up with on the zoning side of things, I mean, it ultimately it's private property and people are going to do what they want to do. We're, we're talking about, you know, through the lens of equity as far as potentially offering the opportunity for more, more different diverse types of housing within neighborhoods we're dominated by, you know, especially R7, um, which doesn't allow very much. And so do we want to be allowing, allowing more housing types that would provide opportunities to people that can't afford to buy a detached single family home on a 7,000 square foot but, but, lot? But throw out, it, see, throw out that last little part. Just throw it out because it doesn't matter to the people that are you're giving the survey to. The question really is, is that um, should we allow different types of housings for uh, everybody to be able to afford? That's the question. Don't throw in all those little, those little words at the end so that low-income people can afford it. No, 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 just throw that out because that's not really the... Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to phrase this wrong. Um, it, it, it raises the buckles of people, right? So if you just ask the question the way that it is without saying uh, for low income, to make it more affordable for everybody, right? Um, I, I'm all for, I, I'm the one that says, you know, we should just make it an R and put every lot at a thousand square feet and let it and get rid of all regulation. I think that'd be fantastic. I think we'd see all sorts of mixed housing around here. But um, um, I guess my point is is that these small little buzzwords that get thrown in, in the, at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of the sentence, um, it almost seems like a justification uh, to get people onto your side for what you're trying to do. Just ask them the straightforward question. Yeah, and that's just from an average Joe point of view. I don't mean to be a jerk about it. I'm just... No, and I understand what you're saying, and I think that that's where things, like Metro has prepared, like, a really nice infographic that shows, you know, incomes for a variety of different jobs in the region, you know, with average salaries and, you know, what that can get you and what type of housing that can get you. I think if you personalize it to that, it's, you know, as far as, you know, this is how much money a school teacher makes and, you know, that really, you know, unless maybe if you're dual income, but that can't really buy a single family. So I understand what you're saying as far as it's not trying to seem like we're leading to that and really be focusing on that equity and, you know, low, quote unquote, low income. Um, so I, I think kind of providing, framing this is that it's a choice and that it's a property owner choice and it's your choice to allow for more housing types where we don't need to get into the specifics. Um, that being said, I mean, like with both through the vision and then with council direction is that they do want to have a focus on equity and affordability. So, I mean, that is part of the process and, you know, that's part of the direction that we've been provided. Um, so we need to find kind of a happy medium that we're not turn. I understand. I mean, there are lots of people that kind of hear these buzzwords and they immediately go to a negative place and there might be a negative connotation and we don't want to be turning people well, off. Or, 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 or go to a positive place without understanding what they're really looking at. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, we have to have a lot more low-income housing. And so they just automatically say, okay, well, let's have a whole, without really taking into consideration the rest of the picture. Yeah, no, I understand. Uh, it leads both ways, you know. 
I think it's a good um, suggestion for us to think about as we move forward, though, is like uh, trying to make the language as accessible as we can for everybody. Mm -hmm. When you pair that with, say, giving like those metro uh, in, in, infographics David talked about, and to me particularly about, we're talking about 20, 30 years, we, want, we do want people to think about your children or your generational move into maybe a different situation. I would hope that we can find the ability that people think they have choices for how they're going to have to go into their next stages in life. Um, I definitely think that's going to be a, something that people will key on. Yeah. Well, and even explaining to people, hey, look, you know, if you buy yourself a smaller house and you plan to stay in it for 30 years, you're going to be spending less and less and you're going to gain more equity at the end. So, I mean, uh, from an environmental standpoint, uh, you know, uh, you don't, you know, if you're just two people and a dog, you, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you don't need more than 1,500 square feet. I mean, I mean, look at the environmental uh, issue of that, you know, and even, you know, we don't need a bunch of 2,500 square foot houses in Milwaukee. Uh, that's not what I'm saying, but, you know, you can educate people that way as well, is that from the environmental standpoint alone. Um, one thing that I was thinking as well is um, to reference the sequencing and that and that transportation will be coming next because a lot of the things that we you know in scenario discussions and and even like you know thinking about sustainability affordability livability like there's transportation within a lot of these questions or points and so just to make sure you talk about the sequencing and how that impacts so we're doing this block and then, you know. What'll be nice too is maybe in the next block, you can visit some of these things that were in the scenarios because the, we're looking at different kinds of strategies of, of housing and placemaking. That'll be very nice as a frame for when we go into more thematic thing about transportation. What do you want to see considering here's what we looked at with these, you know, the, the hub and corridors. Should have some pretty interesting uh, yeah, no. uh, I, uh, opportunity to play on that. And um, that'll be really, I, I like it because also that important tie yeah. between transportation and land use. I mean, it's really, so it's sequencing good. makes sequencing sense. Sequencing makes sense. But I, and it also help, I think, in the town hall because people want to, oh, the traffic's already so bad and the parking's already, you know. And then so, you know, they don't want to see anything happen because it's already so bad. And you're like, okay, well, that we're going to move transportation into, that's the next block, but, you know, certainly. It's actually the. Last block? It's the post-plan block. Oh, we're transportation actually, is in its own yeah. right. goal? Yeah. Oh. Because the. It'll be a TSP update. Because it's TSP update. Oh, Okay. Well, that'll be its own process. Yep. Um, the uh, there, we can touch. Um, there's some transportation-related policies in the in the public facilities section, and I'm not 100% certain how we want to deal with them yet. And that is in the next block. So, um, two more things. Uh, one is that it would be. I think it would be helpful to to. Do what we can to try to show. I mean, there's people have a, 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 a sticker price, you know, focus, but our focus should be on total cost of ownership, you know, total life cycle cost, you know, and, and so, so when you're thinking, you know, of housing and transportation, it's not just, you know, you know, it's not just the rent, it's rent and car maintenance and payments and, you know, blah, 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 um, you know, lost time because I got to take my car to the shop and, you know, all of that. And so there's a total cost of ownership aspect that um, is what's really important over a long-term horizon, um, even at the household level. And then um, the uh, the other thing was, is um, since parking and, and, and traffic was just brought up, um, we need to, we need to really think about the, um, the uh, the impact, how much housing gets eaten by parking, and what kinds of impacts that that has on affordability and equability, equitable <coughs> equity and sustainability, everything. Or we can move the dial doing other options. Yeah, because people are going to complain about parking, and parking will inevitably be the thing that more than the water, uh, the the wastewater plant, parking will be what caps our growth. Yeah. 
So um, we need to we need to turn that on its head, and you know, and, and figure out how do we, you know, how do we prioritize this so that I, you know, I, I still I will always go back to my focus on we need to really be thinking about the orderly transition of land used for parking to land used for useful purposes. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, certainly you know that's a long term goal. The short term goal is what is the impact of parking that we're requiring now going to be. And how is that going to impact um, the, the the market's ability to deliver housing? Yeah, and I mean, I think parking is a good example of you know a, a trade off. You know, as far as if you're not having to be required to provide as much parking, I mean, what, is there a did beneficial you? trade off to you know that could be additional tree canopy, that could be additional open space. I mean. Yeah. You know, how do people feel about would you rather have that additional open space or that additional required parking? Um, so, you know, I think that's an example of where we can get into that. And that's something that is, I think, going to be discussed as part of the, the middle housing, the ADU and cottage cluster, because um, they are, they're going to be proposing, you know, some, you know, as of now, they're kind of workshopping some concepts as far as, you know, reducing the, the required on-site parking and potentially shifting some of that to on-street parking and, you know, what are the pros and cons to that and that, you, you know, especially within a cottage cluster design where it's around common open space, you can provide more of that if you're not having to eat up, you know, a quarter of your site with, with on, you know, with off-site parking and so... Those are things that we do want, want to get some community feedback on. They're obviously touchy, delicate issues, but um, Denny's got it handled. <laughs> yeah, it just it needs to be really. You know, people need to understand what they're what they're costing people, yeah. other people, by insisting on a certain amount of parking. You know, and so when and even if you move the dial down a little bit closer to the to the less you know the less parking side of the spectrum, you're still each of those spaces is still a cost. It's still an opportunity cost. It's still it, it's induced demand. It's you know it's it, it's a it's all of it. And so we we really can't just think of parking as this aside that doesn't really you know we'll clean that up later with the TSP or whatever. Um, you know. Parking competes with housing directly. And people need to understand that and, and make decisions in that frame. Great. Dockless vehicles. That's really what they are. You've been writing a lot of notes here. Yeah, what, what for? <laughs> Just... Just just because oh it's her last meeting today my memoir is a planning commissioner <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> that'll be a, a bestseller I'm sure. hey, yeah. <laughs> absolutely are you going to be able to attend the um, open house i actually um so i'm doing the clackamas county academy oh. um and the first meeting is april 18th from six to eight Darn. otherwise yeah i wouldn't have missed it well, do you have any insights for them and for like what influence your, I mean, it's not your last opportunity to influence right. them. David's super influenceable. <laughs> wow. <laughs> We're going to get all those bridge projects. That's debatable. Uh, it's been yeah, promised. We, I'll have to fight NHA for them, but I, I know I have an in, so. Um, I mean, no, I was kind of looking at the SDC waivers and, um, you know, I think it's really important not to just consider that for, you know, ADUs, tiny homes, cottage clusters. I think it's really important to consider that for everybody that's providing affordable housing and the cost of, you know, um, permitting and SECs and um, the extras that come up along the way, of which I have a example, but I won't bore you with it. It just came up today. Um, it's it's burdensome to the project, and so I would ask that the city, uh, you know, re reconsider and um, make sure that you you don't just caught, get caught up in that missing middle housing opportunity. Um, so for non non private development, waive the SDC fees. Well, if it's nonprofit, you mean? Uh, I, I said non, non, all non-private development waive the SDC fees. Is that what you're saying? If they're providing affordable housing? 
I would I would assume that if uh, a nonprofit's building it or the government's building it. Yeah, I think sub, yeah, sub, sub I would call it subdivised housing. Sub, sub, subsidizing subsidized the housing. Well, yes. Like with construct con, um, CTs or TIFs. I mean, you, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, we do have a affordable housing CET that I mean is starting to build up a little bit of money, um, and that could be. I mean, this is getting pretty programmatic in nature, but could be Sorry. used for that. Um, but yeah, I understand what you're saying that we don't want to be just chasing the the missing middle right now that we need to be thinking about the complete spectrum of housing affordability and that, um, you know, that's, whether that's nonprofit providers or, you know, the county, you know, just how we're thinking about that and how the impacts on, you know, maximizing the amount of housing that they can provide. Because obviously whatever costs you incur is going to have an impact on. Yeah, on it, it's line. a big hit to the total development cost of the project. And I would also... Um, I would suggest uh, also looking just at your processes. And, um, you know, for us, it was really hard to get the SDCs nailed down. And we were well into the project, um, you know, f um, designed before we could, we were at the per getting permits. Um, and the SDCs and the permitting fees still weren't nailed down. So, I mean, I think that's just, Getting, you guys are busy. I mean, the permitting department is very busy, but I think that is kind of a source of hardship, probably not just for us. Yeah. So um, predictability. Predictability is really important for us to be able to make those things pencil and, and get, you know, all of our funders lined up. Everybody wants to know the bottom line, and until you can get that nailed down, at least a, you know, ballpark and you're not, you know, $100,000, $200,000 off. Um, that's a big number, especially when you're working in such um, limited capacity. Um, it's really important for, you know, nonprofits or affordable housing developers to, to be able to have access to that information early on. All right. So that's what no, I'm that's at. definitely something to consider. Okay. I don't have anything. You don't have anything burning? Okay. Yeah, you're welcome to email me. Um, Thanks, you know, if you have any yeah. additional questions, I would also note if anyone knows anyone that's very passionate about housing, we're actually losing our housing and economic development coordinator. She's going to Metro. Um, so if you know anybody that's passionate about housing or if you have just an awful two-hour round-trip commute and you're passionate about housing... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not, yeah. Be funny. Just, uh, Thanks for the just putting that out there. You're about okay. a week too late, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> for, yeah. For me, at least. Okay. Thank you. Well, yeah, thank you. That was a really good update. Um, we didn't get commitment from folks to be there. Did you want us to, so I, let's I just can. go down. Okay. You'll be there on the 18th. I hope so. You hope so. I'm going to try and make it all look at my it. calendar. I'll definitely be there. You can't be there. I, I am uh, tentative with all the meetings that are lining up. My wife is going to kill me if I ask her for another <laughs> night off of work. So. Should we all ask her right now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> bring, her, bring her along. <laughs> okay, Just well, we, you got the date. Date night. A good amount, so. <laughs> there will be food there. Date. Date Somebody date. has to make income in my family. That's what she's doing. Hilarious. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Planning department other business updates. I don't have anything for you. Okay. Um, Planning Commission committee updates and discussion items. Anybody have any other committees? Aren't you on another committee? Um, yeah, I was. Uh, or I've. I haven't been to a, a design, design and landmarks committee meeting for a while. Um, I submitted comments. Um, I think before the last meeting uh, with respect to the downtown design review, um, but I haven't really heard anything about. Um, what was going on with that? I think the last meeting there was a presentation for Coho Point. There was. And so I stayed away um, just in case it comes up for a hearing at some point. I didn't want to be. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I skipped the last meeting um, because of that. And um, the other the other committees were CPAC and housing. And we had those updates. We have a pre-op meeting coming up for the Coho Point 
yeah. project. Um, they've got some interesting concepts um, proposed. So there, yeah, that wasn't. There was an open house, right, on that. Yeah, um, and then there was also an open house on. Um, the housing authority on Hillside Manor too mm -hmm. that happened yeah. and I attended that one but I didn't attend the co yeah. um, there's a the other other things that are out there there's a 12 lot subdivision on 19th that is um, was scheduled for a hearing um, coming up but we're delaying it um, oh. for a couple weeks at least because there are some things that are missing that they need to provide um, in order to uh, have a have us address all the issues um, and I just saw uh, I think there's going to be a pre app meeting for the uh, Murphy um, Murphy site and there is a variance a height variance that's been proposed for the apartment building that's proposed on the McFarland site so wow everything's hopping out there it's kind of crazy oh you know that interesting part about the how all of the housing i mean if you when you count hillside yeah there's like 1200 housing units in the queue. pipeline in the pipeline yeah 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 no that's we're running out of space fast yeah. i mean and that's another thing i guess to highlight is you know people don't really understand that there's stuff in the works and i think it's good for people that are I mean, in this housing crisis, people are desperate, and it's it's. I think it's positive to talk about like we've got stuff coming, mm -hmm. so it's good. Yeah, and I mean, we're purposely going a kind of a non-traditional route from the kind of your standard goal ten analysis and how that drives into your comp plan policies because our BLI said that we would need like 1,200 units right. over the next 20 years. Done. And it didn't include the <laughs> housing authority site because it tends to exclude public properties because that's kind of different yeah. than kind of, um, you know, they kind of, it's still obviously needed housing, but it's kind of outside what you typically plan for through the goal 10 process. And so, but even that, if we're at 800 without Hillside, I mean, we're two thirds of the way to our 20 year supply that's just in the pipeline. Right. Um, and so, you know, I, I think this, you know, kind of community effort and community engagement is important to kind of to frame that, you know, just in the next few years, we could have a thousand units. I right. mean, obviously Hillside's going to take a while, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's an important discussion to have right now. And I think it's an opportune time. Okay. So any other committee updates or discussion items? Only that it's Commissioner Grau's last meeting. Thank you for all your service. Thank sure you. Sure appreciate it. It's been my it was pleasure. Fun. It has been fun. Yeah, I agree. Learned a lot. Thank you. And I, getting to sit with you on the DLC, have probably had the longest tenure. It has been a pleasure. And I tell you what, Denny doesn't like to promote this. Take that home with you. <laughs> Frame it on your wall. <laughs> Be proud of your time. Oh, thank you. Put it in your office, yeah. your new office. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. So the forecast for future meetings on, does that change because you said something was maybe coming in? Is that it the... Is. Yeah, I think, I think the Elk Rock, Elk Rock Estates, Estates will not okay. happen at... The oh, so does that mean no meeting April 9th? No, we, we have still a have a hearing. hearing River Could River. have guaranteed you the 18th. We wouldn't have had a meeting on the... Okay. We'll talk. <laughs> It, if it if it helps, it might be a short one. I don't know. I don't know if that helps at all. But she could just be waiting for you at the beer store, and we'll get you out of here quick. Speaking of that, um, so with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I think, unless there's anything else. No. I'll move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. All right. Adjourned. Thank you. Hey, you get your last.